After deciding to marry my boyfriend, Ethan, and visiting his family's home to greet them on the day, I found myself being rejected by all his relatives who said, don't ever contact us again. We don't want to hear your voice. Perhaps because of their upbringing, being doted on for their good looks, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law were harsh and jealous towards anyone who possessed something they did not. Unfortunately, I became the target of their envy. Both my father-in-law and brother-in-law, without any resistance, joined them in rejecting me. Several months ago, I was able to exact a grand revenge on these four. My name is Amy. I am 27 years old. Now I'm living peaceful and happy days surrounded by love with my husband, adorable child, and my parents. The origin of all this started three years ago when I was 24. It was triggered when my boyfriend at the time, Ethan, proposed to me. Ethan and I were colleagues at work and we became close due to our shared hobby of movie watching. And we started dating after many movie outings together on our off days. Ethan had a calm temperament and was friendly to everyone at work, making him well-liked by many. He disliked disputes and was the kind of kind-hearted person who could forgive others' mistakes. Since the time I entered the company, I was interested in Ethan, so when he asked me out, I was overjoyed and I looked forward to going to work every day. Whenever I made a mistake at work and was feeling down, he would listen to me all night long and I naturally started thinking, I want to be with this person forever. Ethan had dreams of starting his own business in the future, and I wanted to be by his side to support him all the way. When Ethan proposed to me, I was over the moon. Of course, there was no reason to reject him. I accepted his proposal immediately and decided to marry Ethan. On the weekend after Ethan proposed to me, we immediately went to my family's home, introduced Ethan to my parents, and announced our intentions to marry. Ethan was also kind to my parents, and he even had a great time drinking and getting along with my father. My parents seemed to take a liking to Ethan, and they joyfully agreed to our marriage and shared in our happiness. Seeing Ethan engaging happily in conversation with my parents, I sincerely felt fortunate to have met him. The weekend following the report to my parents, we were scheduled to visit Ethan's house. Having decided to go greet them, I realized that I hadn't heard much about Ethan's family from him. But at the time, I didn't think much of it, considering that Ethan was living alone and probably didn't keep in touch with his parents that much. The night before the day we were to visit Ethan's family, Ethan suddenly said during our phone conversation, About tomorrow. My parents might be a bit odd, but don't worry about it too much. I was slightly concerned about what he meant by odd, but I figured I would find out the next day, and since we had to wake up early the next day, I decided not to worry about it too much and went to sleep. Around 10 a.m. the next day, I met up with Ethan at the station and we headed towards his house together. Since Ethan was living alone, this was my first time visiting his family home. Despite what I might say, I was nervous all morning, and when I was walking with Ethan, I hardly heard what he was saying because my heart was pounding so fast. What stood there was a grand mansion, like a castle. The garden was vast, and I was petrified when I thought, Ethan grew up here? My nerves eased a little when Ethan, with his usual gentle smile, said, Are you nervous? It's okay. Let's go. As soon as the front door opened, my mother-in-law was there to greet me. Oh my, you've come all this way? You must be tired. Come on in quickly. She greeted me kindly. She was very slender, well made up, and her hair was beautifully arranged. Her expensive, wrinkle-free clothes were flawless. Once inside, my father-in-law, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, and their children were waiting. Everyone in the family other than my mother-in-law greeted me with smiles, which was a relief. I was warmly welcomed, took a seat on the sofa, had dinner while chatting with everyone, and announced their engagement. Ethan's family was very pleased, especially my mother-in-law and sister-in-law were excited, saying, We are so happy to have such a cute girl join our family. I was moved by the warm welcome from these people. The pleasant conversation continued. Ethan's family were very talkative, and according to the stories that came up, my father-in-law ran a company that sold package tours, and my brother-in-law who lived with them was working there as an executive director, intending to take over the company in the future. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law were housewives, supporting their husbands' lives, and they were living gracefully, attending dance classes and flower arrangement lessons during the day. My sister-in-law also took care of her appearance, and she exuded a confident atmosphere. My father-in-law was very kind, always smiling at me and making me feel at ease by bringing up various topics so that I wouldn't be nervous. I was sincerely glad he seemed like a good person. At that moment, a certain conversation with my father-in-law broke the harmonious atmosphere. Amy, I heard that you work at the same company as Ethan. Are you a contract employee there? 
No, I originally joined the company as a regular employee after graduating from university, just like Ethan. The company where Ethan and I work is a major corporation known to the public as a top tier company. It's a popular company among job seekers and getting hired as a regular employee is challenging. But luckily, I was hired as a new graduate after college. Oh, is that so? Huh. In that case, where did you graduate from? I graduated from Harvard. That's amazing. You must be really talented. I'm so proud that someone as talented as you is marrying into our family. Amy's awesome, isn't she? She is very hardworking. She's competent at work and quick-witted. I'm so happy to be marrying her. My father-in-law and Ethan praised me so much it was embarrassing. In fact, I went to a top-tier university in the U.S. and I studied hard during my high school years, even at the expense of my sleep. My parents, who didn't have much money, worked hard to get me through college. I was determined to attend a good college, land a decent job, and someday definitely give back to my parents. I've been striving towards that with all my heart. Caught up in a lively conversation with the two others, I noticed that my mother-in-law and sister-in-law had gone quiet. I thought, oh no, and I desperately sought a change in the conversation. And noticing a beautiful arrangement of fresh flowers on the table before me, I asked, mother-in-law, that flower arrangement is lovely. Did you put it together? To which she responded somewhat gruffly, what? As if you, a professional working in a top-tier company, have any interest in housewife's time-killing activities. Confused, I wondered why her demeanor had changed when just a moment ago she was speaking with a smile. As if in agreement with my mother-in-law, my sister-in-law chimed in saying, From your point of view, Amy, with your high education, you probably think all us uneducated housewives can talk about is flowers. I hadn't meant it that way at all. Not knowing what to say, I felt a lump in my throat, nearly bringing me to tears. Ethan quickly interjected, Hey, both of you, stop that. Amy isn't the type to look down on people. Ethan's words were a comfort, but I couldn't bring myself to apologize or say anything, so I just kept my head down. Glancing around, I noticed my father-in-law, who had been drinking since noon, snoring and passed out on the sofa. My brother-in-law was clearly bored, yawning and scrolling through his phone, making the atmosphere in the room really intense. Then, at Ethan's suggestion, maybe it's about time we wrap this up, I was finally released from my uncomfortable atmosphere. On our way back to the station, Ethan apologized. Sorry about today. My mom and sister have a high pride. They're particularly sensitive about their high school graduate. From what Ethan told me later, my mother-in-law had been working at a flower shop right after high school, where my father-in-law had spotted her and fallen in love at first sight. My mother-in-law was certainly a beautiful woman. She had many customers coming into the flower shop just to see her. Every day, my father-in-law would frequent the flower shop and after relentless pursuit, they started dating and eventually got married. Even now, it seems my father-in-law is always wrapped around my mother-in-law's little finger, always doing as she says. My sister-in-law was also a beautiful woman. She and my brother-in-law were high school classmates and had reconnected at reunion in their early 20s. Upon seeing how beautiful she had become, my brother-in-law fell head over heels, and after he persisted wooing, they ended up together. My brother-in-law, too, seems to do whatever his wife tells him to. Sure, I have a high level of education, but I couldn't understand why they felt insecure. They were both beautiful women who had kind husbands who would always protect them. I ended the day feeling unresolved and a little gloomy. A part of me started to question, is this marriage going to be all right? leaving me with lingering discomfort. In any case, we received approval for our marriage from both families, so we started to plan our wedding. Even though the Anyees hadn't entirely disappeared, I felt that we would understand each other better if we talked more. Don't worry, I'll always be on your side, Amy. I was able to stay positive. After nearly six months of lengthy preparation and with the final push at hand, it was finally the day before our wedding when Ethan's cell phone rang. It was from his mother. After having a brief conversation over the phone, Ethan let out a surprise shout. What? Why? Huh? We, we can't just change it. Hey, hold on. It seemed like the call had been cut off. When I asked what happened, Ethan shocked me with what he said. My parents, they said they're not coming to the wedding tomorrow. What? What do you mean? I was completely unable to digest the situation and anxiously asked Ethan. According to Ethan, it seemed that the in-laws had forgotten that they had booked a trip for the next day and couldn't attend the wedding. Unbelievable. The parents of my husband are skipping the wedding on the day before the ceremony? We stood there in a daze for a while. 
Not understanding why this happened, we tried calling not only the mother-in-law, but also the father-in-law and brother-in-law many times to get an explanation, but only the dial tone continued to ring and no one picked up the phone. Confused by the sudden situation, we quickly went to the in-law's house, but the lights were off and there were no cars, indicating that nobody was home. I said to Ethan, when I went to greet your family the other day, I wondered if I upset your mother and sister. The atmosphere was quite tense at the end, to which Ethan responded, As I've said before, both my mother and sister have high pride. Smart women tend to be a bit hard-headed. Even if they hold a grudge for such a thing, I wouldn't know. When I asked, But why would your father also skip the wedding? Ethan replied, My dad and brother-in-law, they're both very submissive to their wives. They probably sided with them to not upset my mother and sister. Ethan said this with a distressed look. I was at a loss for words. In the end, we were unable to contact Ethan's family even on the day of the wedding, so we had no choice but to go ahead with the wedding without Ethan's family present. Why did this happen? Did I do something wrong? And was it really true that they forgot they were going on a hot springs trip? Even if it were true, I couldn't comprehend why Ethan's family would choose a trip over attending their own son's wedding. My parents who had arrived at the wedding venue were very surprised when they heard that Ethan's family would not be attending. Ethan said to my parents, I'm very sorry for the trouble my parents have caused. My parents responded, It's not your fault, Ethan. Don't worry about it. Enjoy the wedding. But their expressions were a bit complicated. I felt terrible for making my parents have such expressions at the wedding. During the reception, we could hear whispers among Ethan's friends and mine asking, Why aren't Ethan's parents here? And the boss from work who kindly agreed to give a toast also asked, What happened to your parents? Leaving us wondering how to answer. He couldn't possibly say, My parents are at a trip instead of attending their son's wedding. When we were asked about Ethan's parents that day, we brushed it off saying they were feeling unwell. What was supposed to be a joyous day turned out to be one mentally exhausting day. Several days after the wedding ceremony, Ethan and I went to his parents' house to report that the ceremony had ended. Oh, Amy, it's been a while. How was the wedding? Did you have fun? Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't make it because of my trip that day. I meant to buy you a souvenir, but I got so busy and forgot. She said this with no signs of remorse. No, it's okay. I I'm glad you enjoyed your trip. Inside, I felt sadness, wondering why I had to suffer such treatment. But to avoid worsening our relationship with Ethan's family, I responded with a forced smile. Ethan said, it's unacceptable to cancel the day before. A wedding where all the relatives are absent? Is that even normal? If you didn't want to attend, we shouldn't have invited you in the first place. Then the sister-in-law said, I would have attended if Amy wasn't the bride. What? What does that mean? I was so confused that my head started spinning. Then as if to counterattack, the mother-in-law said, Don't just blame us. I wanted to see my cute son's once-in-a-lifetime moment, but Amy ruined it. I'm a victim too. I'd like an apology. Ethan spoke up on behalf of me, who was too shocked to respond. What do you mean Amy caused it? Amy didn't do anything. Then the father-in-law, who had been silent, finally spoke. Enough is enough. How dare you come in here in the middle of our day off and complain? Is that all you came here for? Get out. He yelled at us with incredible ferocity and we were forcibly kicked out. And as I was putting on my shoes at the entrance, I felt a prick on the bottom of my foot. Ouch! In a panic, I lifted my foot and saw a caterpillar crawling inside my shoe. Ew! I, with one shoe on, ran outside and let the caterpillar go. The mother-in-law and sister-in-law, who had been watching, said, Are you okay? While snickering maliciously. I, who wanted to get out of there as soon as possible, said, Sorry for the trouble. And was about to leave the house quickly when I was stopped by my mother-in-law. Amy, please don't get involved with us except for weddings and funerals. Huh? Before I could ask why, she abruptly closed the door, ending the conversation. I really don't understand what I've done. I just wanted to get along with Ethan's family. On the way home, Ethan kept apologizing to me. He said, You don't have to force yourself to interact with my family anymore. I'm really sorry. The mother-in-law and sister-in-law said they would have attended the wedding if I hadn't been the bride. Feeling as if I was the one who had done something wrong without even knowing why, I started to feel sorry for Ethan. The very next day I woke up to intense itching all over my body. The itch was so unbearable that I jumped out of bed and rushed to the mirror only to find my entire body had swollen up fiery red. I was supposed to work that day but quickly got a sick day and went to the dermatologist. Apparently the swelling on my entire body was due to the caterpillar stings. 
The caterpillar from yesterday, huh? The itching was incredibly intense, and for about two weeks since that day, I was unable to sleep properly due to the severe itching. Come to think of it, I noticed my brother-in-law touching my shoes at the front door when I went to Ethan's house. The old me would have thought a caterpillar had just accidentally crawled in, but at that time, I felt nothing but distrust towards my in-laws. A month after that, Ethan was hospitalized due to ill health. He had been complaining of frequent stomach pains for a week before being hospitalized, so I, who was worried, forcefully made him take a day off from work and took him to the hospital, where he was told that he probably had a gastric ulcer and needed to be hospitalized for further tests. I was told not to contact them unless it was for a wedding or a funeral, so I hesitated, but I thought that it was not something to keep secret from Ethan's parents, so I plucked up the courage and called my in-laws. Hello? My mother-in-law picked up the phone. While the phone was ringing, I couldn't stop my hand from shaking and I felt nauseous the moment I heard my mother-in-law's voice. That's how much I had come to dislike my mother-in-law. Hello, it's Amy. I'm sorry I haven't been in touch. What is it this time? Well, Ethan has been hospitalized due to ill health. They think it might be a gastric ulcer, but he's being admitted for tests just in case, so I thought I should let you know. Ah, a gastric ulcer, huh? Isn't it because you're overworking him? Please don't call me for such trivial matters. I'm busy. Trivial matter? Don't you care about Ethan? I don't want to hear your voice. I'll tell you clearly because you seem dull. I don't want to have anything to do with you from now on. So please don't contact me again. I'm worried about Ethan. That's why I'll call him directly. Then my brother-in-law suddenly came on the phone. Look, you're too persistent. Read the room a little. I don't know if Ethan's been hospitalized or what, but it's annoying to have you contact us every time. He hung up the phone unilaterally. The moment I heard the sound of the phone hanging up, I felt like something inside me had snapped. The in-laws who mercilessly threw harsh words at me, the mother-in-law who said don't contact us, even though her own son was hospitalized, and the entire family of in-laws who rejected me unilaterally, I couldn't forgive them. You don't want me to contact you again because it's a bother? I don't want to have anything to do with that strange family. I will never contact them again, no matter what happens. After that, there were no significant abnormalities in Ethan's test results, and it turned out to be a mild gastric ulcer, so he took medication for a while and his health improved significantly. Of course, I explained the whole situation to Ethan. Ethan, with a look of resolve on his face, told me, Let's stop getting involved with my family. The only person that matters to me now is Amy. If they can't accept Amy, then even if we're connected by blood, they're not family to me. A year after that happened, Ethan finally left his job and realized his long-standing dream of starting a software sales business. He had been dreaming of starting his own business since before we got married. Of course, he leveraged his previous job experience to accomplish this. Ethan worked harder than anyone else at his job to achieve this. Although we're still at the starting point, I was happy to see even a bit of Ethan's dream becoming a reality. And our happiness continued. A year after he started his business, a healthy baby boy was born to us. My parents were overjoyed at the birth of their grandchild. Despite the nearly two hour journey from my house to theirs, they visited us frequently, making each day extremely blissful. Naturally, we did not report the birth of our child to Ethan's parents. Well, even if we had, they probably wouldn't have cared anyway, so it doesn't really matter. We didn't hear a thing from Ethan's parents after the phone call. Feeling relieved that we didn't have to deal with that peculiar family anymore was somewhat comforting. Then, several months later, something happened. The new coronavirus began to spread globally, and our country also declared a state of emergency and called for people to refrain from going out. Watching the news, all we saw were discussions about coronavirus. As the call for non-essential outings to be refrained grew louder, it was clear that the restaurant and tourism industries were severely affected. My heart ached for them. Suddenly, I wondered how the package tour company run by Ethan's father was doing, but it was none of my concern. No. I might have even cracked a smile imagining the state of his father's business. Despite the circumstances, Ethan's business was doing very well. While there was some instability in our income when we first started the business, recently our income has been higher than when Ethan was an employee and everything was going well. Around this time, Ethan started to receive a lot of calls from his parents' home. However, Ethan seemed to be avoiding getting involved with them and he didn't pick up the phone even when he noticed the calls. There were also some voicemails left, but because he decided not to be involved with his family anymore, he ignored them without even listening to them. I often told Ethan, you don't have to worry about me. It's okay to get in touch with them. 
From my perspective, I despise his family. But for Ethan, they're his family who raised him, and I felt guilty making him cut ties with his parents because of me. However, Ethan told me, as I've said before, Amy is the most important person to me, not my parents. If they can't accept Amy, even if they are my parents, I can't value them. I felt sorry, but also happy for Ethan's unwavering kindness. Ethan was still receiving calls from his father and mother every day, all of which he ignored. Then one day, a letter arrived from Ethan's family home. The letter simply stated, Our business is on the verge of bankruptcy and we have some financial matters we'd like to discuss. We need to talk as soon as possible. Pretty audacious for someone who had cut ties with us. Their nerve was just as strong as ever, and they demanded urgent contact. Of course we didn't get in touch. Let him suffer. That's what he deserves. Next thing I knew, my cell phone was ringing. I didn't notice the call as I was at work, but a voicemail was kindly left for me. It seemed like Ethan had not been answering his phone, so the caller had reluctantly reached out to me instead. It's quite audacious, especially when I had told them not to contact me. Reluctantly, I decided to listen to the message that was left on my voicemail. All I got was a message saying, Is this Amy's number? If Ethan continues to ignore me, I'll come knocking. Let him know. That's all it said. Two days after the voicemail was left, Ethan had the day off because it was Saturday. We were enjoying a leisure family day at home. We had just finished lunch and were discussing what to do for the rest of the day when the doorbell rang. When I checked the monitor, there stood my four in-laws. Seeing my shocked face, Ethan came over to check the monitor as well. Ethan let out a heavy sigh and said to me, you don't have to answer. They'll give up and leave if we don't open the door. However, I said, it's fine. They've come all this way, so we should let them in. It's kind of pitiful. Ethan thought for a moment, then said, okay, and unlocked the door. Pitiful? No way would I ever feel that way about such diabolical in-laws. I purposely didn't tell Ethan about the voicemail. All of this was to lure them into our home. Of course, my shock at seeing them through the monitor was just an act. I knew they would show up sooner or later. There was a reason why I let Ethan's parents into our house. The real retaliation is yet to come. It's time for a full-scale confrontation. The entire in-law family had come to our front door. As soon as the door was opened and the four of them marched in without a hint of restraint, spoke in a frustrated tone, how long does it take to just open the door? Such a bunch of ill-mannered people, it's unbelievable. As soon as they entered the house, Ethan's mother saw our son happily playing with his toys on the floor and said, whose child is this? I responded, he's our son. Ah, I remember now, you said not to contact you anymore, so I didn't report it, but I don't think you're interested in anyway, so whether or not I report it makes no difference. Upon hearing this, Ethan's mother stared at me with a look of contempt and muttered under her breath, you are so cheeky. I was starting to enjoy the situation and asked Ethan's father, so what brings you here today? If you wanted to visit, you should have let us know in advance. Ethan's father responded, didn't you read the letter? Do you mean the one that arrived two days ago? I said, to which Ethan's father angrily said, if you read it, you should have contacted us. It said we needed to hear from you urgently. Quick to respond, I said, oh, you wanted me to contact you? But you said you didn't want to have anything to do with us anymore, so I didn't think it was necessary. Looking at the stern faces of the four, it was hard for me to suppress my laughter. Ethan, my husband, remained silent as if letting me say everything I wanted. True to form, he knew how to read the room. It's hard to believe he was born to parents who lack such common sense. Then my father-in-law abruptly changed his attitude and began pleading. I beg you, I apologize for the past. Due to this COVID situation, everyone's been canceling their travel reservations one after another. We're not getting any new bookings either, and who knows how long the situation will continue. If things go on this long, my business will be ruined, so can't you help me out with some money? I responded, I see, that's tough, but no. I'm afraid I have to decline. I don't want to conveniently assist someone who said they wanted nothing to do with me anymore. However, if you're really desperate, if you show me sincerity, I might reconsider. My father-in-law shouted, what the hell? And started to intimidate me with a furious face. But I wasn't scared anymore. I decided to handle things my way. I didn't say you had to. Feel free to leave if you want to. My father-in-law looked vexed, slowly started begging. I'm sorry, please help me out, he pleaded. Seeing that, I didn't respond. He told the other three to also apologize to me, and finally, all four of them started begging. When I responded, no thank you, with a smile, my father-in-law suddenly got angry and banged his hand on the table. He then shouted, 
You, when I'm humbling myself, you're getting high and mighty, and grabbed my collar. Surprised by his sudden aggression, I was about to tell him to stop when Ethan said, Hey, Dad, don't lay a hand on Amy. My father-in-law asked, You're going to take your wife's side when your parents are begging like this? Ethan replied, The most important person to me right now is Amy. I can't care about someone who treats Amy poorly, even if they're my parents. And I don't need any superficial apologies just for money. If you can't apologize to Amy from the bottom of your heart, just leave. At this, my father-in-law, seemingly enraged, punched Ethan square in the face. Is that how you talk to your parents? Blood was coming out of Ethan's mouth from the punch. I tried to say something to my father-in-law, but he was still so angry. He started to kick Ethan, who was on the ground. I yelled, what are you doing to Ethan? And tried to hold my father-in-law from behind, but he shrugged me off and I was thrown back, hitting my head on the corner of the table. I touched the back of my head where I hit it. My hand came back covered in blood. The other three people, excluding my father-in-law, looked shocked and frozen in place. As my father-in-law started ransacking the room, shouting, Where's the money? I quickly opened the balcony window and yelled to the people passing by, Help! I'm being murdered! Five minutes later, the police arrived. When the police arrived, my father-in-law quickly calmed down and began to blather. Sorry for the commotion. I just got carried away with the excitement of seeing my grandson. My daughter-in-law seems drunk or something. She's been shouting strange things. He started with a flippant smile. I explained to the officer, please take this man away. He hit both my husband and me. He's also been ransacking our house, demanding cash. Suddenly, father-in-law shouted, I didn't do anything. And with a curse, he punched a hole in the wall. He was arrested on the spot. The other three of them were also taken to the station for questioning. Afterwards, it seems that father-in-law was held in jail for a while. Ethan, my husband, had been punched in the cheek, but fortunately, it was just a light cut and bruise that healed quickly. On the other hand, the wound on the back of my head turned out to be bigger than I thought, and I ended up getting 10 stitches. I feel guilty for causing Ethan to get hurt as a result of luring my in-laws to our house for my revenge, but I'm glad that they have stopped asking for money, seemingly regretting their actions. From what I heard later, as I expected when they first met me, father-in-law praised me and both my mother-in-law and sister-in-law became jealous. The two of them apparently instructed father-in-law and my brother-in-law to act coldly towards me. Of course, neither father-in-law nor my brother-in-law could stand up to them and were merely doing as told. The caterpillar that ended up in my shoe was likely the work of my brother-in-law, egged on by my sister-in-law. Jealousy is indeed frightening. It's unbelievable how much it can change someone's life. You never know what might happen. Afterwards, as expected, my in-laws had no way of getting their hands on money. Their business went bankrupt. And their house was seized. Now it seems they live in a cheap apartment. Both my father-in-law and my mother-in-law are nearing 70. It's difficult for them to find work again. My brother-in-law had been working at father-in-law's company, but taking advantage of being the boss's son, he didn't work seriously and seemed to spend all day at the casino. Approaching 50 with no useful skills, it's hard for my brother-in-law to find a job and it seems he's now making a living with a part-time job at a convenience store. My sister-in-law had been a stay-at-home wife with no significant career, and she seemed to be job hunting at employment agencies and the like. However, due to her selfish personality, she kept complaining about this and that and couldn't hold a part-time job down for long. Now, she seems to be cooped up at home. A little after that incident, my father retired and we decided to live together with my parents. The person who proposed living together was none other than Ethan. It was because I am an only child and he was concerned about my parents' life and their old age. I've returned to work now, and my parents take care of our son during the day, so I feel secure balancing childcare and work. Ethan, my beloved husband, and my kind parents. And of course, my son, who is my treasure. Life with them is the happiest. I resolve never to forget to be grateful for this happiness. Taking only my valuables, I dash out of the house, running down the busy streets towards the train station. I run up the stairs of the station. At the platform, I wait for the train to my hometown as I try to suppress my anxiety. I look around nervously to see if anyone is following me, but I don't even know what I'm running from. I don't know why I've had to give up on the honeymoon I was looking forward to and have ended up being forced to run. But I'm trying to flee from this town as I trusted my husband telling me to run. My name is Megan. I'm an office worker who just turned 30. Despite always feeling like a newcomer, 
I found myself in a position to teach others before I knew it, leading a busy life. I have a fiancé, Bob, and we're getting married next year. Bob is my colleague at work, and three years younger. He's so mature and reliable that my colleagues often tease me, saying, we can't tell who's older. He's a man who commands trust from superiors and subordinates alike, handles household chores flawlessly, and I think he's an ideal partner for marriage. Except for one thing. One weekend, we needed to visit my in-law's house together. As we open the door to the living room, two women are relaxing, sipping tea. Welcome home, Bob. Welcome back, Bobby. Ignoring me completely, the women greet him with sparkling smiles and Bob's sighs. <sighs> Why is Catherine here again? Well, Catherine is like a daughter to us, right? Right, Mom? Oh, if I become Bobby's wife, I'll really be your daughter. Oh, how wonderful. Bob sighs again as my mother-in-law and Catherine start giggling and making a fuss. I was filled with the urge to go home right then and there. Catherine is a neighbor of my in-laws and Bob's childhood friend. They've been close since they were babies up until high school. Catherine has beautiful eyes and a slender figure, and with her expertise in acting cute, she's the type of girl that men can't leave alone. For some reason, she's fixated on Bob. And it started right after Bob told his parents about our engagement. She's been aggressively texting Bob, inviting him out for drinks, and whispering things like, I'll feel sad if you get married, and didn't you propose to me when we were little? I felt uneasy at Catherine's assertiveness and asked Bob if he was interested in his cute childhood friend. To that, he made a disgusted face. She juggled five guys at once in the soccer team in high school. In college, she seemed to only date men who had girlfriends or wives. I'm too scared to marry a woman with no sense of chastity like that. Well, you're right. I was taken aback by Catherine's lack of fidelity but relieved to know that Bob was not swayed by her. But my mother-in-law is on Catherine's side. She's trying to push me out by flaunting her closeness with Catherine. Apparently, she doesn't like me, because I'm older than her son, taller, and work too hard for a woman. She seems to be unaware of Catherine's wildness and thinks that Catherine, who at first glance appears elegant and obedient, would be easy to handle and boast about as a daughter-in-law. Because of those two, we faced the worst possible experience at our wedding a month later. Unbelievably, Catherine, who wasn't even invited, showed up at the reception. And she wore a pure white dress, which of course only the bride is supposed to wear. Of course, it wasn't as lavish as a bridal gown, but the fact that it was white didn't change. And she was the center of attention in the venue in many ways. What was even scarier was that during the reception, she had the audacity to sit at the family table where my mother-in-law was. During our slideshow, and even during our friends' speeches, I couldn't help but be bothered by her chatting it up with my mother-in-law. When they approached our table at one point, my husband argued with them, as he tried to hold back his anger. Catherine, you weren't invited, and you're wearing a white dress. And sitting at the family table, what the heck are you thinking? What are you doing, Mom? But it's my childhood friend's wedding. I can't not celebrate it, and white matches my skin the best. Oh, I agree. The white dress looks really good on your fair skin. You look the best in this venue. I requested the seat because you forgot to prepare it. Don't worry, I'm sharing the meal with her. Ugh. My husband, unable to vent his frustration, looked down in despair. Looking at my father-in-law, who was at the family table, he had an apologetic look on his face. Although my father-in-law is a decent man, he's weak-willed and probably got bulldozed over by his wife. We've been eagerly preparing and looking forward to this day for nearly a year. It's so frustrating, I feel like crying, but if I cry now, it will only please these two. I'm not going to show them my tears. When I raised my face and smiled at Catherine, I saw the corners of her eyes twitch. Coming to celebrate even though you weren't invited? Catherine, you're really thoughtful of your friends, aren't you? Huh? Catherine grimaced. And it's so nice of you to share half your meal. Please do share half of your favorite filet mignon as well. 
Oh, my mother-in-law's eyes wandered. Oh, it's almost time for me to change outfits, so please step back. I'm sorry I'm so busy. I mean, I am the main event after all. With that said, and showing a calm smile, the attendant who was with me said, Can we please let other people take pictures with the newlyweds, please? And kindly moved them out of our way. I was grateful for her excellent work. Catherine glared at me for a moment with demonic eyes, but then immediately plastered on a cutesy, idol-like smile and left. I'm sorry I'm not the weak woman who would cry and wail. Thanks to the excellent attendant and the staff, the reception turned out alright. I was exhausted, but aside from those two, I received heartfelt blessings from everyone else and was able to fully appreciate the happiness. We didn't start living together right after our marriage. Since job transfers are announced at the end of the fiscal year, we thought it would be safer to find a new home afterwards. So, for our honeymoon trip planned two weeks after the wedding, we each plan to leave from our own homes and meet up at the airport. Once we start living together, there'll be fewer chances for rendezvous, so I thought it'd be fun to do something that feels like we're still dating. The destination for our honeymoon is Italy. My mind was filled with the allure of Italy, especially it being my first overseas trip. I was thrilled and excited each day leading up to it. However, my excitement was about to be ruined by the two. On the day of the honeymoon, while I was nervously opening and closing the suitcase, checking that I hadn't forgotten anything, I got a call from my husband. Hey, what's up? We're meeting up at 1pm, right? I'm sorry. Huh? Contrary to my easygoing self, my husband screams in a desperate voice. We have to cancel the honeymoon. Please don't come to the meetup spot. What? Listen, don't leave the apartment. No, actually, leave right now and go back to your parents' home. Please. Well, wait a minute. What's going on? I'm sorry. I'll explain later. Just leave right now. Stunned, I stare at the phone after being abruptly disconnected. I have no idea what's going on, but my good mood has suddenly gone down the drain after hearing my husband being frantic. Could he possibly be involved in some sort of crime? The mere thought sends chills down my spine. With my legs about to buckle from all the anxiety, I force myself to move and decide to return to my parents' home as per my husband's instructions. Naturally, my parents are in a panic. Their daughter, who was supposed to be going on her honeymoon, has come home with a pale face. Seeing the disgraceful behavior of my mother-in-law at our wedding, they were even more worried. Even if I wanted to explain the situation, I too was at a loss because I didn't know why I was there. Then, I got a call from an unknown number. I sensed something was not right. It was the police. Fearing that I was indeed involved in a crime, I pressed the answer button with bated breath. The police officer, with a much softer voice than I expected, explained why he had called. We got a call about a couple of women screaming and banging on your apartment door. They seemed quite agitated, so we took them into custody. The older woman claims to be your mother. What? Wait, me? Because I had put the call on speakerphone, my mother, who was listening next to me, let out a bewildered shout. Even the police officer on the other end, hearing my mother's voice, seemed taken aback with a surprised, Home? Huh? I was dumbfounded for a moment, but I soon realized who the older woman was. It was my mother-in-law, and I assume Catherine is with her too. I don't know why they came to my house on the day of our honeymoon, but I'm sure they're the reason my husband was panicking. Our flight was now hours ago. Because of these people... Our honeymoon is gone. No Venice, no pizza, no pasta, no tiramisu, no maritozzo, all of which I was looking forward to. This is awful, just awful. I'm never forgiving them. My mother is sitting right next to me. Those people are complete strangers. I stated firmly to the police officer. Hold on, Megan, it's me, it's me. I could hear my mother-in-law screaming from the other end of the phone but the officer must have sensed something as he smoothly ended the call with, Thank you for your cooperation. I suspect that my mother-in-law and the others came to my apartment with the intention of causing me harm. How crazy is it 
that they would claim to be my mother when they're in trouble. Several hours passed. My husband showed up at my parents' house late into the night. As I suspected, the ones who were held by the police were my mother-in-law and Catherine. Somehow, they found out that we were meeting at the airport, and they had planned to stop me from going to Italy. Then, Catherine planned to run up to my husband, waiting at the airport, and lie to him, saying, Your wife has run off with another man, planning to comfort my distraught husband, and maybe even take my place on our honeymoon and deepen their relationship. I wonder if they really thought they could easily take my place right before departure. It's not like this lie wouldn't be exposed when we returned from our honeymoon. What short-sighted thinking, I thought. But their dreadful plan didn't end there. After stopping me, they intended to take me to a man my mother-in-law had chosen. To my mother-in-law's 50-year-old unemployed brother. For that purpose, they had Catherine's cousins waiting in a car, which gave me chills. If this plan went through with my mother-in-law's brother and me, and my husband and Catherine, my mother-in-law thought we probably wouldn't be able to stay as a couple. It was a terrifying plan. How my husband found out about this terrifying plan was thanks to my father-in-law. He happened to hear my mother-in-law and the others making plans and secretly contacted my husband. My husband was planning to do a little work before heading to the airport, so when my father-in-law called, he was still at work. He immediately called me in a panic. By the time he delegated his work to a colleague and arrived at my apartment, my mother-in-law and the others had apparently already been taken away. After that, he went to the police with my father-in-law, sorted out various things, and finally managed to get here. My husband apologized profusely for the actions of my mother-in-law and the others, and for our cancelled honeymoon. He did everything he possibly could, and seeing how worn out he had become in just one day, I couldn't bring myself to blame him. But I will never forgive my mother-in-law and Catherine. I will never forgive them no matter what. From that day on, I switched from defense to offense. First, I claimed for the cost of repairs to my apartment door that they had destroyed, various fees to the management company, and the cancellation fees for the honeymoon. Apparently, they were enraged, thinking I was playing hooky and kicked the door, and even hit it with a nearby fire extinguisher. The door was a new high-end one that I had just replaced, so the repair cost was high. I also had splurged on the honeymoon, so everything in total came close to $20,000. Of course, they resisted. No, I'm not the one to blame. It's Bob who won't admit he loves me. All I wanted was your happiness, Bob. Huh, I get it. Bob, you really are kind. If you're not willing to pay, we're going to court. C court? If we go to court, we'll also pursue the fact that you tried to kidnap my wife. The costs and the amount claimed are likely to increase. Oh. Uh. At the mention of the word court, the mother-in-law began to tremble and Catherine began to sob. But Bob, you forgive me, right? I'm your precious girl, aren't I? I'll never forgive you. Eek. Catherine let out a small shriek at the cold glare of my husband. But I love you so much, it's cool. You do love me too, don't you, Bob? There's no way I could love a woman who casually dates five guys at once or goes out with a married man. A what? what Five guys? The mother-in-law looks at Catherine in shock. I also back up my husband. You say you love Bob, but you only started saying that after he and I got engaged, right? Even if you're not interested in a man, you suddenly want him when he's someone else's. If you... The mother-in-law glares at Catherine. She must have hit a nerve. Catherine's eyes dart around in panic. Then she points at my mother-in-law and shouts, You're the main culprit. She tried to use me because she didn't like her daughter-in-law. Oh my, you're trying to pin the blame on me? Bob, this woman led me astray. I tried to stop this terrible thing. What? The two began to argue fiercely, as if they're about to grapple with each other. The two of them, who had been so friendly, have suddenly broke up. What a fragile friendship. In the end, Catherine's parents and the father-in-law intervened, and it was decided to split the claim amount exactly in half. 
Catherine's parents, who had not noticed their daughter's disgraceful behavior at all, were very apologetic. We brought in a lawyer and filed a restraining order for Catherine and the mother-in-law. Of course, the mother-in-law refused in tears, but their plan was so malicious, even though it was foiled. Neither I nor my husband intended to forgive them. Three years later, we were living peacefully with our newborn child when a man visited our home. The man, who was stylishly dressed in an expensive suit, introduced himself as Catherine's fiancé. I went back to Catherine's parents' house to say hello, and I happened to meet one of her classmates who told me, Wasn't she supposed to steal Bob? Oh. My husband, hearing Catherine's name for the first time in a long time, face palms. The classmate Catherine and her fiancé met must have attended our wedding and seen Catherine's disgrace. I thought it was a joke, but I was concerned about Catherine's pale face. I'm sorry, but I had it investigated. You and Catherine were childhood friends, but you're not dating now, are you? Of course not. We've never even dated. When my husband emphatically said this, the fiancé looked relieved. But she might be dating someone other than me. What? The Catherine I know is the type who dates a different guy every day of the week. What? Even though she wasn't invited to our wedding, she showed up wearing a white dress and brazenly sat at the family table. N no way. I think if you're going to investigate, you should widen the scope, not just me. Uh, Alright. Catherine's fiancé responded in a faint voice, then staggered away from our house. It seemed they really did carry out an investigation afterward, and Catherine's history with men embarrassingly came to light. It turns out, Catherine's fiancé was the son of a somewhat prominent CEO, and the entire family was furious at Catherine, who had falsely portrayed herself as a chaste woman. Apparently, she had been dating several men while engaged, and not only was the engagement called off, but she's also apparently being sued for damages. If she hadn't let her desire to steal someone else's man get in the way of our wedding, she might have made it to a life of luxury without anyone finding out. Well, her true nature would have been exposed eventually. But this is way too much poetic justice. My mother-in-law seems to be fretting over not being able to meet her first grandchild. She's apparently watching with bated breath as my father-in-law cheerfully brings baby supplies over to our house. There have been several instances where baby clothes were sent via my father-in-law, but I sent them back without even looking at them. Catherine was dumped by her fiancé and drowning in debt, and my mother-in-law was unable to see her beloved son and grandchild. Right now, them being neighbors, they seem to get in a catfight every time they see each other. The neighbors who have to witness these ugly disputes are certainly not enjoying it. Hey, Megan, how about we visit the Miami Sea Quarium on the second day, and on the third day, let's head to Key West. I heard there's the overseas highway. Sounds beautiful. I also want to eat seafood at a Cuban restaurant. I want to swim with the fishies. This year, as our son turns three, we're planning to take the honeymoon we never got to have. Our destination is Florida. The main goal is to show our son dolphins. Of course, we also plan on trying all the food specialties like Cuban food. We haven't given up on Italy, which we had to put off because our son is still too young. It may be far off in the future, but if it's with my husband, we can make it happen. All because I feel so content and happy every day. Thanks for wasting our time today. I understand this is a marriage proposal, but we do not approve. Please give up and go home now. When we went to my boyfriend's family home to announce our engagement, his mother glared at me, speaking down to me like this. I knew from the start that his parents didn't like me, but I can't back down here. I steeled myself and proceeded to introduce myself to my future in-laws. My name is Marina. I'm 26 years old and work in the general affairs department of a manufacturing company. I have a boyfriend who I've been dating since last year. His name is Travis. He's three years older than me and we work in the same department. He has a soft expression and his kindness shines through when he smiles. That's what made me fall in love with him. Since we both live alone, we often visit each other's places and enjoy our dates on the weekends. We've built a happy relationship. 
My parents' home is nearby, though I often take Travis to their place to hang out. My parents really like Travis, and when he visits, they always serve up great meals than usual. Travis gets along well with my father, and I thought that everything would be fine even after we got married. However, Travis has always been reluctant to introduce me to his parents. When I asked him why, he looked troubled. Could you wait a little longer? My parents are nothing like yours. I wish I had been raised by people like your parents. When he said this, he looked somewhat sad. I wondered if he might be on bad terms with his parents. I decided to wait until he was ready to talk about it. I wasn't in a rush to get married, and I thought it would be best for him to tell me when he was ready. But life doesn't always go the way you want it to. One holiday, while Travis and I were heading to our favorite restaurant, a surprising turn of events unfolded. As we were guided to our seats by the staff, Travis suddenly looked shocked and began to fidget uncomfortably. What's wrong? I asked. He was at a loss for words and could not answer properly. Um, well, he said, looking away. Wondering if I had done something wrong, I felt anxious. Just then, Oh, isn't that dear Travis? I haven't heard from you in a while. I was wondering what you were up to. A woman in her 50s approached our table, chatted amiably with Travis, and then looked at me appraisingly. She had distinctive, downturned eyes that made it feel as though she was glaring at me. Perhaps her hair, tied neatly at the back, accentuated the slant of her eyes. As I returned her gaze with a puzzled look, she let out a dismissive chuckle. Are you really hanging out with a country hick like her, Travis? You're such a good kid. If you don't like it, you have to tell her straight. Otherwise, girls like her won't get the hint. At her words, Travis's face tensed up. He glared back at the woman and defended me. I won't tolerate any insult to her. But the woman, giving me a pierced look, said, It's a pity my boy's been fooled by a girl like you. Leave Travis alone right now! Then she headed toward the cashier, paid her bill, and left the diner. What was that about? I asked, looking at the departing woman. Travis responded with a weak voice. That's my mother. A few years ago, because of her, I had to break up with someone I was considering marrying. She said she didn't want to get married if it meant dealing with a mother like that. So that's why she had such an attitude. Yeah, if you decide to continue being with me, there will be a lot of complications. Should we break up here? Don't worry, I won't bring my personal issues into work and I'll make sure you won't have any trouble. Travis looked pained. I see, but I still want to be with you, Travis. Do you really want to break up with me? Travis looked shocked at my words. You know I have such a mother. If you marry me, it will be a burden on you. I don't mind. I think that's part of marriage, and we don't have to live with her, right? We will never live with her. If she insists, I'll request a transfer at work and we can move far away. Travis looked at me very seriously. I returned his gaze with a smile. Then I feel reassured. Is it strange if I propose to you? Are you sure? Yes, of course. I want to live with you in the future. I said, feeling heat spread through my body out of embarrassment. I was sure my face was turning red. I feel a bit upstaged, but I'm really happy. I want to be by your side for the rest of my life. Finally, Travis smiled and I felt relieved. Afterward, Travis and I decided to introduce ourselves to my parents. They were delighted and eagerly asked how we had decided to marry. This meant I had to talk about my soon-to-be mother-in-law. We tried to sidestep the conversation, pretending to be shy. We were hoping to divert questions about my mother-in-law, but my mother wouldn't allow it. Have you already introduced yourself to Travis's parents, or is that still to come? Travis and I were taken aback by her question. 
No, I don't plan on informing our parents about us getting married. What? Why not? Travis's answer caused my mother to gasp in surprise. Because I'm sure my parents would never approve of our marriage. At this point, my father gave us a stern look. That's not acceptable. Marriage is a union of two families. Your mom would be devastated if she found out you were married without her knowledge. You both should at least greet them once. If they still refuse, come talk to us. We'll certainly help you out then. My father's words were strong and reassuring. However, Travis gave me a look of concern. I'm fine. I said this with a smile, hoping to ease his worries. I thought if we couldn't overcome this hurdle, we wouldn't be able to find our true happiness together. Later, Travis informed his parents that I would be coming to greet and introduce myself. They didn't seem welcoming, but he managed to arrange the meeting anyway. Travis's father was a CEO, and they lived in a large house. The yard was also expansive. When I stepped in, a large dog started barking. Travis approached with a smile and petted the dog's chin. The dog quieted down and let me pet him too. While we were playing with the dog, the front door opened and his parents came out. His mother, with her sharp gaze, exuded an intimidating aura, and his father, equally high-handed, looked down upon me. Don't touch our dog! You're disgusting! Those were the first words out of his father's mouth. Without even a greeting, he started berating me. I felt extremely uncomfortable. How dare you speak to her like that? If you keep acting this way, I won't hesitate to cut ties with you. When Travis said this, his parents glared at me, but didn't make any further unpleasant remarks. They invited us into the house. I found it a bit strange. Travis, with just one look at his face, you would think he's a kind person because of his gentle eyes. I thought he took after his father because his mother had upturned eyes but he didn't resemble his father at all. Things like skipping generations in genetic traits are not uncommon, and there are plenty of kids who don't resemble either parent. So I thought maybe it's best not to delve too much into that matter. I entered the house, and as I was looking around, a middle-aged man in a suit appeared. Welcome home, young master! Upon seeing Travis, he bowed to greet him. His kind smile was contagious, and I found myself smiling back at him. It's been a while, Mr. Williams. You're all grown now, young master. Mr. Williams looked at Travis and smiled warmly. It was the first time I saw Travis genuinely smile since we arrived at this house. He then introduced me to Mr. Williams. This is Mr. Williams, my father's right-hand man. To be honest, he's more like a father to me than my own. My father never showed much interest in me, so Mr. Williams often took care of me. You're the boss's son. I was just doing what was expected of me. But you've always had a soft spot for me, haven't you? I have to say, I like you more than my father. Travis chuckled. Seeing him laugh innocently felt like a first. As we were talking, my mother-in-law emerged from a room in the back of the house. Marina! What are you doing? Come here right now! She shouted angrily. She glared at Mr. Williams. What do you think you're doing? Slacking off from work? How many times have I told you to stay away from Marina? I'll make sure my husband hears about this. You better head off to work. I... I understand. I'll do as you say. With that, Mr. Williams nodded and left the room. As an office worker who only does clerical work, I wonder if being the CEO's secretary means you have to visit the CEO's house and be at the beck and call of the CEO's wife. Travis glared at his mother and protested. Why do you always treat Mr. Williams so harshly? How can you be so rude to someone who's been working so hard for dad? Quiet! You should just do as your parents say. I'll deal with that man. Now come over here. Following my mother-in-law, Travis and I moved to the living room. 
Travis and I sat on the sofa across from my in-laws, and my mother-in-law was the first to speak. Thanks for wasting our time today. I heard you two are here to greet and introduce yourselves to get our blessings, but we don't approve of you two getting married, so just give up and go home. I was prepared for the snide remarks. This didn't bother me at all. No, thank you for taking the time out of your busy schedule for us. Travis and I love each other. It's natural for two people in love to get married. Don't you agree, father-in-law and mother-in-law? I replied with a composed smile. However, my mother-in-law gave a deliberately exaggerated sigh. Ugh, you don't understand anything about marriage, do you? Since our last meeting, I've looked into you. You're a mediocre woman who, after graduating from a nothing special average university, joined a small-scale company. And despite your lack of remarkable skills, you've managed to ensnare my Travis, haven't you? Do you really think a woman like you is good enough for our family? Good match is what's important in marriage. Mom, Marina and I work at the same company. We work the same way, in the same place. If Marina is incompetent, then so am I. We're a good match. Travis, you're different. There must have been a reason for you to lower your standards and join that company. This woman only had that option available to her. And besides... My mother-in-law, smirking, turning a mocking gaze at me, and continued... Seems like you come from a poor family. After our money, are you? At my mother-in-law's insinuation, I felt my blood boil. I had resolved not to let anything she said upset me. But when she brought up my parents, I couldn't hold back my anger and found myself retorting. Please don't just assume we're poor. What's wrong with calling a spade a spade? Living in a run-down 50-year-old house... Driving a car that was released 10 years ago. Ah, uh, did I hit a nerve because I'm spot on? This is why I can't stand poor people. My family home was built by my great-grandfather, who was a carpenter. It's precious to us. As for the car, we simply like it and have kept it running smoothly. There's no reason for us to be labeled as poor. You did your research, didn't you? You must know what my parents do for a living. Yes, I know your father is a university professor and your mother is a high school teacher. I acknowledge they have respectable jobs. However, there's too much of a disparity between our families. Listen, Travis is slated to take over his father's business someday. Don't think for a second that the daughter of mere educators can marry my son. With that, my mother-in-law cackled loudly. That's when Travis stood up. His face was transformed into something I'd never seen before. A scary expression, replacing his usual gentle smile. It was a waste of time trying to talk to you people. I'm cutting ties with you. There's no way I could forgive you for bad-mouthing someone I care about. Marina, let's go. There's no point in trying to persuade them anymore. Travis grabbed my hand, and we left their house. I'm sorry. I'll explain to your parents that we couldn't even have a conversation with them. Please don't say you won't marry me. I could only nod in response to Travis's desperate plea. Travis and I went straight to my parents' house and told them what had happened as his parents. Travis had anticipated this might happen, and had brought along a voice recorder. All of my mother-in-law's snide remarks were recorded, and after listening to them, my parents pondered a bit, and then said, Sure, the way his mother spoke was not nice, but you two are giving up too easily. We'll try to work out a strategy, so you go ahead and keep making your wedding preparations. If you, as adults, have decided to marry, you don't need parental approval. Still, it would be best if you could get Travis's parents' blessing for your marriage. As my mother calmly stated her opinion, Travis and I felt our spirits settle and we managed to nod in agreement.
we decided to leave matters concerning Travis's parents to mine and discussed our future together. One month later, my parents called us and Travis and I visited my family home. As we entered, we found Travis's parents and Mr. Williams seated around a small table. When we joined them, the room became rather crowded. I thought Travis's parents might start making snide remarks again, but they sat quietly. It was my father who filled us in on what had been discussed in our absence. Travis's parents looked into us, and so we decided to investigate them in return. His parents married 30 years ago, after his mother became pregnant. At that time, his father had just started his company. Mr. Williams, who was an ordinary employee at that time, had also supported his father devotedly. As my father was explaining, Travis interrupted. All that is common knowledge in our family. Mr. Williams started as an ordinary employee, but was promoted to the position of my father's personal assistant in recognition of his achievements. My mother raised me almost single-handedly while my father was struggling with managing the company. It seems Mr. Williams supported not just my father, but my mother as well. As Travis finished speaking, my father nodded. Mr. Williams indeed supported your family in a very dedicated manner. Now, the topic is going to shift a bit. I am a genetic researcher at the university. Genetically, children inherit half of their DNA from each parent. Even if the child and parent look very different, they are certainly inheriting half of their genes from each parent. What are you getting at? Travis threw a questioning look in the middle of my father's explanation. I also wondered why my father started talking about this. My usually mild-mannered father had a stern look on his face as he addressed Travis's parents. Please, hear me out. I hired a detective to conduct a background investigation on your parents. Your father works diligently, and Mr. Williams was always there to support him. Your mother is devoted to housework, so much so that it was inspiring. However, when I looked at your pictures, something seemed odd. Neither of your parents have a widow's peak, but you, Travis, do. This trait is known as a dominant trait, meaning a child with a widow's peak can only be born to a parent with the same feature. Moreover, don't you think Travis looks a lot like Mr. Williams? Particularly the drooping eyes and the widow's peak. So, I thought maybe, and I called your parents here to talk. After my father finished his explanation, Travis looked at his parents and Mr. Williams in astonishment. Unlike my father, I am a French teacher like my mother, and I am good at French. I never noticed the difference in their foreheads. Even if I did, I am no expert in genetics. After a period of silence, Travis's father began to speak. Thirty years ago, I was so consumed with my work, I neglected my family entirely. That was when my wife told me she was pregnant. I had been hiding about my infertility from my wife. I was angry about my wife's affair, and she was angry that I had kept my infertility a secret. After a big fight, I told my wife that if I were to raise her child as my own, I would forgive her infidelity. In turn, she said that if I forgave her infidelity, she would forgive me for hiding things. Then, I made Mr. Williams my personal assistant and kept him under watch to prevent my wife from continuing the affair. After Travis's father spilled everything, he sat there with a blank face as if his soul had left his body. On the other hand, his mother began to sob. I, I loved Mr. Williams. I wanted to raise Travis with him. Travis is a treasure that I created with a man I truly loved. I can't hand him over to a woman I don't know. I absolutely will not allow this marriage. As his mother wiped her tears and glared at me, Travis gave her a contemptuous look. 
I've always been aware that I wasn't loved by you, Dad. I felt my mother's abnormal obsession towards me. I often wished that Mr. Williams had been my real father. But what's this now? You three are disgusting. Mom, I no longer want to think of you as my parent. And even if Mr. Williams is my biological father, I won't recognize you as such. I won't forgive any of you. I will cut ties with you all and marry into Marina's family. As Travis uttered those words, his mother rose and began to cling to Travis, crying. That's not allowed! Travis is mine! I won't hand him over to anyone, especially not to some commoner. Let's live together, then I will allow your marriage. So don't say you're marrying into another family. As Travis's mother grabbed his arm, I swatted her hand away. Ma'am, can you please stop? Travis is clearly uncomfortable. Do you understand how much he has been hurt and troubled because of you? Probably not. Because in the end, all you care about is yourself. If you only betrayed your husband to be with Mr. Williams and continue to deceive Travis, I wouldn't say anything. Because that's a matter between just the three of you. But for you to interfere with Travis's happiness? I'm not going to sit here and let that happen. Why don't you put his happiness first? If you don't like me, that's fine. But if you just want to manipulate him as you please, you're failing as a mother. From now on, I will make Travis happy, so don't get in our way. After I blurted that out, his mother began to cry again. She was cursing at me, calling me a cruel woman. But Mr. Williams was comforting her. And we decided to discuss future matters at a later date. A few days later, Travis's parents officially apologized to my husband and me, and my parents. They accepted our marriage, and Travis and I officially turned in our marriage certificate. Travis moved into my house. In the end, it seemed Travis's father could not forgive his wife's infidelity. Too much time had passed to ask for compensation, but they divorced and split their assets. Mr. Williams also resigned and moved far away with Travis's mother. His mother's luxurious lifestyle came to a sudden end, and she was forced to live the impoverished life she had always looked down upon. She occasionally sends letters asking Travis for financial help, but he ignores them entirely. Travis has severed ties with his father because they are not blood-related. He has no intention of becoming Mr. Williams' adopted son now, though legally, he remains to be the son of his father. They seem to have come to terms with this. Once Mr. Williams resigned and Travis's mother was no longer around to support him, Travis's father's company performance plummeted. He resigned from his father's position, and no one knows where he went after that. A year after marrying Travis, I saw that his parents' house had been put up for sale. We had a wedding ceremony, but because of Travis's complicated family issues, we kept it small with only close family and relatives. Even so, it was a memorable occasion, and I was satisfied. Now, we have been blessed with a beautiful daughter, and I have quit my job to devote myself to raising her. My parents occasionally visit and help take care of our daughter, which is a great help. Travis and I plan to support each other and raise our daughter with love. Are you happy now that you've switched to my sister? Of course. Anyone can see that Lucy is more attractive than you. Can't you even understand that? It was definitely the right decision to dump an old hag like you. <laughs> As Tom uttered these words, my sister chuckled quietly. Well, I'm glad you think so. I've been thinking it's good to be away from you too. Thanks for breaking up. What? My name is Sophia. I'm a 40-year-old office worker. Until very recently, I had a boyfriend. His name is Tom, two years younger than me, and we met at a mixer party. I wasn't planning on attending the mixer, but my colleagues convinced me to go, just to make up the numbers. I had doubts about being the only middle-aged woman there, but all the men were 35 or older, and many were close to my age. I thought 
I could have a good time, and I had a lively conversation with all the men at the party. Amidst all this, it was Tom who was keenly interested in me. Tom and I had similar tastes, such as liking the same artist, smoking the same brand of cigarettes, and enjoying the same food. We clicked well, and Tom started inviting me out on dates and for meals. After that, we started dating and our relationship progressed smoothly. Sophia, your cooking is delicious. Thanks. Maybe it's because I've lived alone for so long, and I used to cook a lot as a substitute mother for my younger brother and sister. Oh, you have a sister too. I'll have to say hello to her sometime. <laughs> At that time, I didn't think much of it, but now I feel that him mentioning only my sister, not my brother, hinted at his flirtatious character. We started dating about a year and a half ago, and even then he showed signs of being emotionally abusive. Sophia, is dinner ready yet? Just a little longer. I'm, I'm making it now. What? I'm starving here. You're really inefficient. Despite us both working, he didn't do any household chores. Although he often came home earlier than me, he would just laze around on the sofa watching TV. What? Stew again? Give me something hearty or fried. Yeah, make croquettes. Well, if I start making croquettes now, dinner will be very late. Huh? It's easy to make those things. You're really bad at this. Just go to the grocery store and buy some. Tom would boss me around and give orders like this. He also mocked my appearance. You're really ugly. <laughs> Whenever he saw a beautiful female celebrity on TV, he would compare them to me and hurl abusive words. He would also call me an old hag, which was quite ironic coming from him, who was only two years younger. Whenever he got irritated or things didn't go his way, he would insult me to keep his mood up. However, he was very gentle at other times, saying things like, I love you, Sophia, or I feel calm when I'm with you. So I thought that the occasional insults were just a sign of him showing his true feelings because he loved me. Looking back now, it was a shockingly foolish interpretation. I came to realize the old saying, love is blind, is indeed true. After we had been dating for about a year, he started coming home late. I have to work overtime today, so I don't need dinner. He would just send that message and call it a day. And every time he came home, he was drunk. When I mention that he smells of alcohol, Tom gets huffy and claims he only had a drink with his colleagues after work. But it's clear to me that he's had more than just one drink. His face is red, after all. But if I push him any further, he'll yell back tenfold, so I don't have any choice but to stay quiet. However, I couldn't help but sigh when I found business cards from strip clubs and brothels in his suit pocket. Well, if he's stressed out from work, I guess he needs some sort of outlet. But even though he's dating me, he still does these things. He's called me an old hag and an ugly duckling before, but I believed he still loved me as a woman. However, these days, he hasn't been doing that sort of thing. He's been satisfying his desires elsewhere. I've been wondering if we can even still call this dating. But amidst all this, Tom did something surprising. Today, it's on me. Let's go get some sushi. Huh? What's the occasion? Nothing much. Just a token of my daily gratitude, I guess. I found his shy response endearing, and I was excited to go eat sushi. It wasn't high-end sushi, but it was delicious, as it's been a while since I last ate sushi. When we got home from enjoying our sushi, Tom said, I've got some special beer at home for us to enjoy tonight. Oh, thank you. I was surprised since he hadn't done anything like this in a while. It wasn't a special day or either of our birthdays, so I couldn't help but wonder if there was a catch. Then, Tom bashfully dropped a bombshell. Well, I haven't prepared a ring yet, but how about getting married? Huh? It was an unexpected proposal. I was so taken aback that I couldn't respond immediately. As I sat there wide-eyed and stunned, Tom asked me, Is it no good? I was honest about how I felt. I'm sorry. It was so sudden. I, I'm shocked. Uh, I see. I was happy, but I had to voice my concerns. I'm, I'm thrilled you proposed, but you've said so many cruel things to me, right? And it seems like you go frequently to those nightclubs. Why did you propose to me despite all that? When I asked, Tom responded while looking me in the eyes. I guess it's because if I'm going to get married, I want it to be with you, Sophia. 
I've said terrible things to you, and I'm truly sorry. I've taken your kindness for granted. I promise I won't say anything to hurt you anymore. So I want you to marry me. Being told that so directly, I couldn't help but be swayed. I accepted his proposal right then. I was suddenly so happy at the thought of getting married. I couldn't stop grinning. But even then, our old patterns didn't change. Hey, old lady, get me a beer, will ya? Hey, didn't we agree you wouldn't call me old lady? Ugh, you're such a nag. Sophia, old lady, both are more or less the same six-ish letters. It's not the same at all. You're always nitpicking. It's annoying. That's because you're breaking your promise. You promised me when you proposed. If this is how it's going to be, I can't bear it. Ugh, then you shouldn't have accepted so easily. Saying that, Tom, irritated, took his beer and secluded himself in his room. Another day he shouted, Don't get cocky, you old ugly hag. Any young woman is way better than an old hag like you. When he started talking like this, I too didn't hold back, replying, If that's the case, why don't you find a young woman and move on? But you're settling for me because no young woman would look at you now that you're an old man, aren't you? When I teased him like this, he would get furious, his face turning beet red. Don't you have any sense of gratitude or awareness that you've been chosen? If that's how you want to choose, let's annul our marriage. All right, let's call off the marriage. Saying so, Tom once again retreated to his room with a beer in hand. Looking back, he seemed to be drinking excessively around this time. Maybe his heavy drinking was what made him short-tempered and his words harsh. Still, the next morning he would apologize. Sorry, it was my fault. I only have you, Sophia. Sorry for being such a lousy boyfriend. But I really want to marry you. When he said these sincere words, I, in the end, would always forgive him. A few months passed since he somewhat proposed and finally we started preparing for the marriage. First up, meeting each other's parents. It was my first time meeting his parents, but they were very kind and approved of our marriage. Now it was his turn to meet my parents. Ah, welcome, Tom. Lucy, long time no see. My sister, who was living at home, greeted us. Tom had visited my home a few times and had met not only my mother, but also my brother and sister. It was his first time meeting my father, but my father is not scary, so he interacted with Tom normally. So Tom and my sister are getting married. I never thought she would beat me to it. Right? You're already in your late 20s. Time flies. Hey, Mom, stop teasing me about that. My sister puffed up in anger while my mom laughed maliciously. In fact, my sister and I have quite an age gap. She is currently 28. That means there's a 12-year gap between me, who just turned 40, and her. Even though she's in her late 20s, my sister has a beautiful face, so she looks more like she's in her early 20s. My family approved of the marriage, and Tom and I steadily prepared for our wedding. But then, out of nowhere, he suggested we break up. I didn't understand why. Why? We're about to meet both families. Uh, we don't have to cancel the family meetings. <laughs> what do you mean? Then the doorbell of our house rang. Wondering who it could be at such a time, it turned out to be my sister. Lucy, sorry, I'm a bit busy right now. No problem. <laughs> I'm involved too. <laughs> huh? With that, my sister strode into our house. When I followed her, Lucy called out, Tom! And to my surprise, threw her arms around him. Oh, you sure took your time, didn't you? <laughs> he chuckled. I was picking out some cute lingerie for you, Tom. And that made me late, Lucy laughed. Really? Can't wait, Tom said, patting Lucy's bottom. What's going on? I asked. Huh? Can't you see? This is what's happening, Tom replied, laughing and pulling Lucy closer to his side. I'm sorry, sis. I fell in love with Tom, and he fell for me too. So I'm going to be the one marrying him, Lucy announced, followed by a guffaw. Unbelievably, just before our wedding, Tom switched from me to Lucy, as if she had just proposed to him. I, I felt like I was about to faint from shock. We'll be moving to our new home now, Tom said, heading into his room and coming out almost immediately. It appeared that he had already packed his belongings. You'll be alone again, sis, but you're already 40, so isn't it fine to stay single? <laughs> Lucy taunted with a malicious laugh. 
Even after they had left, I stood there in a daze for quite some time. What was the time I had spent with Tom all about? Upon reflection, he was a worthless scumbag. But he must have had some charm, too. The loss of him brought me intense grief. I cried for a while. It wasn't until I reached out to a friend and talked to my younger brother on the phone that I began to feel a bit calmer. As I calmed down, I was able to think more clearly. As my mind cleared, I felt pure anger rising towards Tom and Lucy. I wanted to pay them back to make them regret Tom breaking up with me. With that in mind, I decided on a plan for revenge. When I told my brother about it, he agreed to help me. A few days later, the day came for the two families to meet. Apparently, Tom had not yet informed his parents as they greeted me with, Thank you for marrying Tom. My parents, too, seemed to be in the dark greeting the other couple as Sophia's parents. Then, Lucy dropped the bombshell. Actually, I'm the one marrying Tom. Both sets of parents were thrown into confusion, questioning Tom and Lucy, then turning their questioning to me. Tom and I broke up recently. He seems to have taken up with Lucy, I said. While both sets of parents were angry, I calmed them down, saying I was no longer angry and that they should accept the marriage. The meeting ended on an awkward note. And soon after, Tom and Lucy announced they were getting married. They seemed grateful that I had smoothed things over and invited me to the wedding. I attended the wedding not as the bride, but as a guest. As the ceremony approached and the room began to fill, I headed to the room where Tom and Lucy were waiting. When I entered the room, they were happily chatting. The place where Lucy sat should have been mine, but I no longer felt any envy. Tom, Lucy, congratulations on your wedding, I said as I entered the room. They seemed surprised to see me, but quickly approached with smug smiles. You really have some nerve, don't you? Any normal person wouldn't come to the meeting or the wedding after being dumped by their boyfriend for their sister. <laughs> You're definitely a bit off, aren't you? Lucy added, grinning. I asked Tom with a gentle smile on my face. Are you happy now that you've switched to my sister? Then Tom burst into laughter and said, Of course, anyone would agree that Lucy is more attractive than you. Can't you see that? It was absolutely right to ditch an old hag like you. Hearing Tom's words, my sister Lucy giggled as well. Good for you. I'm glad I'm free from you too. Thanks for breaking up with me. What? Tom seemed flustered, not expecting such a response from me. My proud sister, irritated by my composed statement, bit back. Sophia, you must be envious. You're pretending to be strong, which is lame. You must be unbearably regretting that I took your boyfriend, right? Well... Anyone who's happy about being cheated on is just a pervert and the minority. I was frustrated too, but when I thought about it calmly, I genuinely felt good about breaking up with such a terrible man. What the hell is that supposed to mean? As you said, you've called me an old hag and have been overly dominating. If we were married, that would count as emotional abuse and I could sue for damages, you know. Imagine how horrible a husband you'd become if you already acted this way while dating. My sister's face turned pale at my words. Emotional abuse? Tom, is that true? Tom hurriedly denied it. Lucy, don't believe her. I'm a man who treats the woman I love with great care. That means I will take very good care of you. Tom. Just when the two seemed to switch into lovey-dovey mode, I played a certain voice recording. Don't get cocky just because you're an old hag and ugly. Younger women are far better than old hags like you. I'm sorry I was wrong. There's only Sophia for me. I'm sorry for being such a lousy boyfriend, but I really want to marry Sophia. Lucy was stunned after hearing the recording. This, this is Tom's voice. These are some of the things he said while we were dating. He'd throw harsh words at me one day and ask for forgiveness with sweet words the next. This is his pattern. N no, no way. It seemed that Tom hadn't anticipated I'd be prepared with such evidence and he snapped at me in a state of panic. Hey, stop messing around, you old hag. You're just nasty. I'm glad I didn't marry you, ugly, old, and bad-tempered. What's the point of living? Just as Tom said this, the door of the green room banged open. 
In walked Tom's parents. Tom, that's enough. Stop embarrassing yourself in front of our relatives. What? What's going on? Your conversation has been broadcast throughout the entire house. Everyone heard. No way. Tom went pale all at once. No. Is this some kind of a joke? My words were... Every attendee heard it all today. I'm disappointed to hear you're such a pathetic man, Tom. I'm going to apologize to the guests right now. Get moving. Tom's father grabbed Tom by the scruff of the neck and he was ushered out of the waiting room. Lucy collapsed onto her knees, looking completely stunned and hung her head. Both Tom and Lucy had paid a heavy price this time. They found no sympathizers among relatives, colleagues, and friends, all of whom distanced themselves. Tom, who worked in a predominantly female environment, seemed to have been demoted due to the scandal. Lucy, on the other hand, was warned by her friends that they couldn't hang out with someone who would steal her sister's fiancé, that their own boyfriends or partners might be next. As a result, no one invited her out anymore. However, once she found out that Tom was abusive, she seemed to have completely lost interest in him, and they ended up breaking up. But since they had already submitted their marriage license, they became divorced almost instantly after having spent a fortune on the wedding. Lucy was cut off by her parents, brother, and me after the incident and is now reportedly forced to live a frugal life in a cheap apartment working as a freelancer. Now, the reason why our conversation was broadcast throughout the venue at the wedding was because of a favor from my brother. He owns a company that handles sound systems, not just for large-scale events and concerts, but also for most of the weddings in our area. The venue for Lucy and Tom's wedding was handled by my brother's company. So he explained the situation to the staff beforehand and had them put a small pin microphone on me to broadcast our conversation to the venue. I didn't expect Tom to make such a spectacle of himself, but the plan was a complete success, and I had my revenge. Afterwards, I decided to throw myself into my work. I was promoted and was put in charge of a project where I ended up dating a man from a client company. He is the same age as me and is divorced, but it seems the reason was his wife's infidelity. He is very kind, doesn't change his attitude suddenly or make harsh remarks, and always speaks to me gently. We haven't talked about marriage yet, but I feel like I can be with him for a long time. But I'm not hung up on marriage anymore, so for now, I'm going to fully enjoy the time I spend with him. Pregnancy isn't an illness, you know. You think someone will come and help you when you're acting sick? My husband Bob harshly threw those words at me while I was suffering from morning sickness. What the? He doesn't even know how I feel. Amid my struggle to understand, divine retribution struck Bob, who had so callously disregarded me. My name is Lisa. My husband Bob and I met at work and we got married. Leaving work is customary for women after getting married, but I continued to work. Three years into our marriage, I became pregnant with our long-awaited first child. The day I found out I was pregnant, I told Bob right away, Bob, we're going to have a baby. In response, his eyes widened. Wait, seriously? I'm going to be a dad? I went to the doctor today. I'm eight weeks pregnant. Whoa, seriously? I can't wait for our baby. Thank you, Lisa. He hugged me tightly and pledged. I'm going to do my best to be a good dad. A few days later, we also told our in-laws. They always said, a child is a gift from God, and made sure not to pressure me. I wanted to share the news with them as soon as possible. Lisa, thank you. I didn't think we would meet our grandchild this soon. I'm really happy. Aren't you too, dear? Yes, indeed. It feels like a dream to see our Bob become a father. Thank you so much. My in-laws were moved to tears. My mother-in-law, who obviously had experienced giving birth too, regularly would ask if I was okay, always caring for my well-being. A gentle husband, wonderful in-laws. We're going to build such a happy family together. So I thought. But two weeks after finding out about my pregnancy, something suddenly changed in my body. Oh, I feel sick. Could this be morning sickness? I felt nauseous whether I was awake or asleep, and the constant feeling of nausea at work made it hard to eat properly, causing my health to decline rapidly. I had decided to work up until maternity leave, 
but I couldn't continue working at this rate. I decided to talk to my husband. Bob, can we talk for a second? What's up? Actually, I'm having a hard time with morning sickness. I'm thinking about quitting my job instead of waiting till it's time to take maternity leave. Oh, really? Well, if that's what you've decided, why not? Huh? Um, yeah, thank you. I was somewhat taken aback at how easily he accepted it. Maybe he respects my feelings that much. I had already decided to quit after giving birth, so he might just see it as that happening a bit sooner. My parents live far away, and considering their poor health, I'm not planning on traveling back home to give birth. Although I'm anxious about having my first child, I'm sure I can get through it if my husband is with me. I spent my days believing this. One month later. It took a while to get done with the handover process, but I was able to quit my job smoothly. Now I just need to stay rested until the due date. But my health didn't improve at all. At first, I was doing as much housework as I could, but as my belly grew, it became more and more difficult. Bob, I'm sorry, can I just serve bread for breakfast starting tomorrow? When I asked my husband, he turned around with a surprised face. Huh? Why? I'm giving you money for living expenses, right? No, it's not about the budget. I'm feeling sick with morning sickness. It's really hard to get up in the morning. I'll buy the bread. Feel free to make whatever else you like. You mean you want me to prepare my own breakfast? Huh? So you want to sleep in while I prepare my own breakfast and head to work? No, no, I didn't mean it like that. Whoa, unbelievable. Here I am, working my tail off every day for you, Lisa. And the moment you become a stay-at-home wife, you start slacking off on housework. Must be nice. With that, my husband left the living room. Why? Why would he say something like that? It's not like I asked to get morning sickness. I'm only enduring these rough days to nurture our baby. Holding back my pent-up emotions, I cried alone. Someday, he'll surely understand. I forced myself to believe that. Time passed, and I finally entered the last few weeks of pregnancy. With a belly so large that I could no longer see my feet, I was doing my best to manage the household chores. Bob, I'm sorry, could you take out the trash today? One morning, I asked my husband as he was about to leave for work. Huh? Trash? Don't you usually take it out yourself, Lisa? Well, yes, but today's trash is quite full and heavy. My belly has been aching since the morning, and I was hoping you could just help me out this one time. The next moment, my husband uttered unbelievable words. You're a housewife, right, Lisa? Who do you think you are? What? What does he mean by, who do you think you are? What is he asking me right now? Without waiting for my response, he continued. I've been thinking this for a while, but being pregnant isn't an illness, right? So why are you acting like you're having such a hard time? Acting? What are you talking about? I'm genuinely in pain. And that's the thing, you keep pretending to be sick so people will help you, don't you? Lisa, I never knew you were so cunning. I'm a bit shocked. Wait a minute, that's not it at all. I may not be sick, but it's true that I'm in pain. And my belly is so heavy. Let me tell you straight, you're pampered just because you're pregnant. Lately, you've been cutting corners with cooking and cleaning. That's not a good housewife, you know. Asking your husband to take out the trash before he goes to work? Are you out of your mind? With that, he left for work. I could feel my shock towards him gradually turning into anger. Who the hell does he think he is? I'm literally carrying your child inside me. I'm not asking him to stay by my side at all times. But is it too much to ask for a little consideration? That point, I stopped relying on my husband. Though I was worried about the baby, it was better than arguing with my husband and being made to feel bad about myself. After that, I did the household chores without pushing myself too much, and a month later, I gave birth to our daughter, Mina, without any issues. My newborn baby was incredibly cute, and that was enough to blow away all the pain from delivery. Even my husband, who hadn't helped at all during my pregnancy, adored Mina, and I was glad he did. But all he does is adore her, that's it. He doesn't change diapers, doesn't feed our baby, doesn't soothe her when she cries. There, there, good girl. Mina, you're so adorable. Oh, you smiled. You have bright eyes like me. You're the cutest in the world. Huh? She's about to cry. Lisa, quick, take her. He cuddles and spoils our daughter only when she's in a good mood and hands her off to me when she starts fussing. 
He doesn't care even when I'm busy with housework. Whenever it suits him, he hands off our daughter. I can't even be efficient with housework. On top of that, I'm hardly getting any sleep from having to breastfeed every three hours. I'm constantly feeling foggy when awake, just as exhausted as when I was pregnant. Then one day, I was nursing our daughter as usual when I got a text from my husband who was in the bedroom. Can you come here for a second? Come here for a second? I'm right here in the living room. I'm struggling with a headache from lack of sleep and doing my best to breastfeed. Just as I was getting annoyed, another text came urging me to hurry up. Waiting for our daughter to fall asleep, I headed to the next room where my husband was. Upon opening the door, I found my husband wrapped up in his comforter. As soon as he saw my face, he frowned and said, Something's wrong, I have a headache. Can you bring me some water? Isn't that because you were drinking late last night? To my sigh of exasperation, my husband retorted in an irritated tone. What? You want to say it's a hangover? It's not like that. I got sick or something. Just hurry up and bring me a glass of water. What's with that attitude? Why are you always so bossy? Huh? What about you? You see your husband in pain, but won't even bring him a glass of water? You're the worst. It was then that I felt myself falling out of love with my husband. This is no joke. Only talking to me when he needs something. He was so cold to me during my pregnancy. This is it. I'm not putting up with him anymore. I pulled out my phone and called my in-laws. Oh, sorry to bother you all of a sudden. Is that you? Bob is suffering from a severe headache. Yes, that's right. He's fussing that he's sick. Can you come over? My husband was staring at me with a puzzled expression. After hanging up the phone, I said to my husband, Your mom and dad are on their way here now. Inviting my folks over? You're overreacting. Overreacting? You are the one complaining that you're ill, right? But still, there's no need to call for my parents. I just wanted some water. If you want water, can't you get it yourself? What's with that attitude? Who do you think you are? Who do you think you are? That's what I should be asking you. I raised my voice unexpectedly, causing my husband to flinch. Don't, don't yell like that. It's making my headache even worse, you know? So what? You never considered my feelings when I was suffering, so why do I have to be considerate of yours when you're hurting? Don't you think that's unfair? Oh, I won't let you say you've forgotten. You ignored me when I was suffering from morning sickness, even when I asked for a bit of help with the housework. To top it all off, you said, what makes a housewife so special? Well, that was... Who the hell do you think you are? I've been doing everything in my power for the last 10 months to nurture our child in my belly. Oh, calm down, Lisa. Pregnancy is a thing of the past, right? There's no point bringing that up now. As he smirked, I stared at him coldly and continued. A thing of the past? Who said it was only about pregnancy? Huh? Hasn't it been the same since our daughter was born? You never help out with household chores, always dumping our baby's care on me. All you do is dote on her. You don't do anything else. What? Well, that's not true. I take care of our daughter, too. Take care of her? How? You're going to tell me you're parenting? Just so you know, all you're doing is spending a little time with her when she's in a good mood. The moment she starts to cry, you dump her on me. Never changed a diaper or fed her a bottle. Which part of that is parenting, huh? Tell me. That's... that's... While I was grilling my silent husband, the doorbell rang. His parents were standing there, looking concerned. After leading them to our bedroom, I turned to them and said, I'm sorry to bring this up so soon after you've arrived, but I've decided to divorce Bob. What? The three of them opened their mouths at the same time. But Lisa, divorce? Why on earth? After all that, I still had to explain myself all over again to my husband, who seemed incapable of understanding his wrongs. Why don't you get it? During my pregnancy and even after our child was born, you never once offered me any support. But that's not true, I was just... You said to me, pregnancy isn't an illness. You're being too dependent just because you're pregnant. Even when I was dealing with morning sickness and couldn't do any of the housework, you wouldn't help with even the smallest tasks, like taking out the trash. After Mina was born, you didn't help with diapers or feeding her. How am I supposed to continue living with someone like you? Hold on, not in front of my parents. Just then, my mother-in-law, who had been listening to our conversation, chimed in with great rage. What's going on? Bob, please explain. Is everything Lisa just said true? Well, that's, um... Speak up now. Did you really tell Lisa pregnancy is an excuse while she was pregnant? Did you really say such horrible things? 
No, that's not it. Lisa was pretending to be sicker than she actually was. Pretending? You do realize that pregnancy symptoms vary from person to person, and some women do suffer terribly from morning sickness? Are you even aware of that? Of course, I know about morning sickness, but not being able to do any housework, that's ridiculous. Hearing my husband desperately trying to defend himself, my father-in-law, who had been silent until now, muttered under his breath, Unacceptable. My mother-in-law started trembling, then yelled at my husband, who was making excuses. Enough already! You're always acting so bossy, even though you've never experienced pregnancy. You have no idea how life-threatening childbirth is. My husband was stunned, probably not expecting his own mother to yell at him like this. His mouth hung open in surprise. My mother-in-law did not stop. How can you behave this way towards Lisa, who carried and nurtured your child for nearly a year? I'm ashamed as a mother. Despite having such a beautiful daughter, you haven't even once changed a diaper or fed her. You've failed as a father. M Mom, hang on. I won't wait. You've made Lisa wait all this time, haven't you? If Lisa wants a divorce, then the least you can do is listen to her for once. You foolish son. With that final blow from his mother, my husband was defeated. I went and got the divorce papers and made my husband sign them in front of my in-laws. And so my marriage life came to an end. After the divorce, I planned to go back to my parents' house. As I was leaving, my in-laws hugged me numerous times. Lisa, we're so sorry about our stupid son. We really apologize. It's not something that can be fixed with an apology, but we're truly sorry. It's not your fault. You've been very kind to me and I appreciate it. I'm the one who should apologize for things turning out this way. No, it's okay. We think this is for the best for you and Mina. That's right. Please feel free to visit us anytime you want. Of course. I appreciate everything you've done for me. With a final word of gratitude, I parted ways with my former in-laws. Even now, after some time has passed since the divorce, I still keep in touch with them. They seem to have cut all ties with my ex-husband, Bob. We met at work, so when the reasons for our divorce got out, Bob found himself on thin ice at the office. Did you hear about Bob? His wife left him because he didn't help out with their baby at all. Even before that, he didn't do anything when she was pregnant, despite his claims of being a modern hands-on dad. <laughs> Seriously? No wonder she divorced him. In this awkward atmosphere, Bob had no choice but to keep his head down and carry on with his work. After all, he has no other option. He has to keep paying child support until our daughter turns 18. It may seem like I've taken her father away from her, but I have no regrets. I believe our daughter Mina will understand when she grows up. From now on, I'll do my best to raise her with my parents' support. My mother and my ex-husband showed up at the funeral of my precious father. I sarcastically said to them, Nice of you to show up after all you've done such a thing. But they seem not to mind it at all. This is my father's funeral. Their presence is a given. I couldn't stop laughing at my mother's comment. I came here for inheritance. <laughs> Sorry, but there won't be any inheritance for you. My name is Lila, a 32-year-old office worker. I have been married to my husband Kevin for two years now. We met several times as business contacts and gradually got closer and started dating. However, I was hesitant to date him at first because he was six years younger than me. When I asked him, are you okay with an old lady like me being your girlfriend? He looked straight into my eyes and said, I don't care about age. I like you, Lila. I was taken aback by his unashamed confession and fell for him. From there, we steadily continued our relationship and eventually he proposed, leading to our marriage. We immediately went to meet his parents. His parents were very kind people, and they accepted me. I quickly grew to like his cheerful and outgoing parents, who were much like my husband. Then, we went to my family home and introduced him to my parents. He's quite young, isn't he? But he's very polite and seems like a nice guy. My parents quickly took a liking to him. He also had a positive opinion about my parents, saying, Your parents are very kind. And so, without any issues, we got married. After our marriage, we both worked while sharing household chores, based on what each of us could do. Lila, your cooking is really good. 
Really, I'm glad. This is a recipe my mother taught me. No, actually, I studied it myself. My mother didn't cook much. I guess she was very particular about salads and oils, though. Oh, is that so? She's health conscious, then. Well, she used to be a model. Really? Oh, didn't I tell you? From around high school until she was 19, she worked as a teenage model. She got pregnant at 19 and married my father and quit her modeling job once. But she went back there for about 10 years after I started elementary school. I didn't know. I thought she was very beautiful, but it makes sense if she was a model. Next time, you should tell her directly. I think she would be really happy. All right, let's go to your family home on our next day off. My husband cared a lot about my parents and often suggested visiting my family home. I am very grateful because I can see my parents regularly thanks to him. In this way, our married life was going very well. However, an unfortunate incident happened to us. My father had an unexpected accident and has been wheelchair-bound ever since. Lila, can you come today? It's fine during the day because we have a caregiver, but it's hard at night because I'm alone. Okay, I understand. I'll come after work. I was very worried about my father, and to be honest, my mother is not good at housework, so I was worried about leaving the caregiving to her. I told my husband that I would go to my family home after work to take care of my father. Then my husband, Kevin, unexpectedly offered to drive out and pick me up, saying that he would accompany me back to my parents' home. Thank you. That's a big help. Don't mention it. If your parents are in trouble, we've got to help out. At that moment, I saw him as a godsend. Lila, it's so nice of you to come. And Kevin, thanks a lot for joining us. I feel bad for asking you to come all this way. Not at all. Please don't worry about it. Dad's asleep in his room now, but he'll probably need to use the bathroom soon. I understand. I'll go check on him. Thank you, Mom. Is there anything I can help with, too? Well, there are a few things I'd appreciate it if you'd come move. Ever since my husband became wheelchair-bound, there's no one here to lift heavy things. I see. Of course. You can count on me. It seemed like Kevin was more than willing to help my mother with her request. I was glad he came with me. Dad, you're awake. Lila, thank you for coming. I woke up because I heard your voices. I see. Do you need to go to the bathroom? I can help you get there. Hmm. I might take you up on that. I feel awful for putting you through this. What are you saying? Thanks to you, Dad. I was able to attend college. Now it's my turn to pay it forward. Thank you. After caring for my father, Kevin and I went back to our home. When we arrived, Kevin had a suggestion. How about we move in with your parents? What? Honestly, it must be tough for just your mom and dad to live alone in their current situation. But are you okay with that, Kevin? It's not your parents, and you might feel uncomfortable. Not at all. Your parents are genuinely kind, so I'm totally fine living with them. Kevin? I was truly grateful for his proposal. Honestly, I was thinking the same. My mom and dad have a 15-year age gap. My dad was a business owner, and he met my mom at a high-class party. There, my dad was smitten at first sight with my mom's beauty, and they started dating. They decided to get married when they found out that my mom was pregnant. My mom was not good at housework, so my maternal grandmother used to come over to clean and cook. In fact, I remember my grandmother cooking when I was a child. My mother had a unique perspective that as long as she remained beautiful, she didn't have to do anything else. So she didn't do any housework at all. I learned to do housework and cook when I went to college and started living alone. But my mom is helpless. She can't take care of my dad on her own. So I wanted to be by my dad's side and support him if I could. There's another reason why I want to live with him. What's that? The truth is, I'm pregnant. Really? Yes. Seriously? Am I going to be a father? That's right. In that case, it's all the more reason for us to live with your parents. I agree. I'll contact my mom right away. When I told my mother that I was going to live with them, she agreed, saying, That would be great help. 
Hence, my husband Kevin and I moved to my childhood home and began our life together there. This opportunity also allowed me to become a full-time homemaker. While caring for my father at home, I successfully proceeded with my pregnancy preparations. My mother would take me to the hospital when needed, and even though I couldn't cook, she would buy the food we ordered from the supermarket. This was really helpful to me, and it was a huge relief to live at home where I rarely had to be alone. Kevin also seemed to communicate well with both my parents. He would express concern for my father's health and would engage in enjoyable conversations with my mother. Seeing this, I truly felt blessed to be married to him. Kevin, could you accompany me for shopping? I heard that a supermarket a bit far from here has cheaper ingredients today. So I was thinking if we could take the car, my mother asked. Of course, I'd be happy to. Just leave it to me, Kevin replied. The relationship between my husband and mother is like that of a true mother and son, and they often go shopping together on weekends. As my pregnancy progressed and it became more difficult for me to go outside, I was truly grateful that Kevin and my mother were always willing to do the shopping. Time passed, and I successfully gave birth. It was a healthy baby boy. The family rejoiced at my safe delivery and commended me. Now that a boy was born, he could potentially take over my father's business in the future. I believed that our family life would become even more lively and fun. However, I encountered an unbelievable scene. This happened on the day I was about to take my son shopping. I wanted to buy baby supplies, but the store I was aiming for was far from home. So I decided to drive, thinking it would be quicker to buy the items myself rather than having Kevin mistakenly purchase the wrong ones. I asked him to take care of my father while I went shopping. I got into the car and drove for about 10 minutes when I realized that I had forgotten to bring my wallet. I hurriedly turned around and drove home. As I was about to go to my room on the second floor to get my wallet, I heard a strange noise coming from my mother's room. Our house was designed such that my father, who was wheelchair-bound, lived on the second floor, while Kevin, my mother, and I had rooms on the second floor. I didn't see Kevin or my mother in the living room on the first floor. I had a terrible feeling. Quietly, I approached my mother's room. I could hear a creaking noise and heavy breathing. I can hear this loud and clear. Quickly, I set my phone to video recording mode and flung open the door. What the hell are you doing? I asked. To my shock, both my husband and mother were naked. In other words, they were having an affair. They quickly began to dress. What is this all about? You are having an affair, aren't you? I questioned them, and both of them were unapologetic. Well, yes, but there's nothing we can do about it. Kevin says he prefers me, my mother said. I'm sorry, but I find your mother more attractive, Kevin confessed. Yeah. It seems that Kevin liked older women, and even when he started dating me, he didn't mind the age gap. Do you think you can get away with this? I asked. Well, whether we're forgiven or not doesn't matter to us, my mother answered. Well, I guess we're moving out and living together, just the two of us, Kevin said. So you're saying we're getting a divorce? I asked. Yeah, of course, he replied. All right, then. I'll get the divorce papers ready right away. To my own surprise, I found myself carrying on the conversation with an unexpected calmness. Perhaps it was because I knew I needed to stay strong for my father, who needed care, and for our newborn son. I suppose you're going to divorce Dad. I'll get your divorce papers ready, too, I said. Then my mother made a shocking statement. I'm not getting a divorce. What? I'm not divorcing your father, but I am moving out of this house. Wait, enough with the jokes, I replied, taken aback. I'm not joking. I won't leave him until I've gotten his assets, and that's until he passes away. Shockingly, my mother refused to divorce my father just to inherit his assets. Indeed, regardless of the steps taken, being married means the spouse is entitled to a share of the deceased's estate. Just how low can you go? I said, glaring at my mother with clenched fists. 
I'm just choosing the more beneficial path. I'll squeeze out every last penny I can get, whether from the old man or otherwise, and then I'll be with a young and wonderful man. I was so astounded that it went beyond anger. Kevin, I'll be divorcing you no matter what, I announced. Sure, go ahead, but I might refuse to divorce depending on the conditions, he retorted. Ugh, what conditions? I grumbled. Mother-in-law, or rather, Anna, you accept that she's refusing to divorce father-in-law because you're going to pull some strings, aren't you? So I want you to maintain the status quo between Anna and father-in-law instead of divorcing me, he said. Don't be ridiculous. There's no way I can agree to such a condition. Then I won't divorce either, and I won't pay child support. What? Well, make your choice. Kevin and my mother were smug expressions. I had to inform my father about this at once. I can't make that decision without considering Dad's feelings. I protested and ran downstairs. My father seemed to be awake. He must have heard the conversation. Don't worry about me. Get a divorce immediately, he said. But if I do, you and Mom won't be able to get a divorce, I explained. Don't worry about me. Just leave that man. He insisted, looking me straight in the eye. Perhaps my father had a strategy of his own. I decided to follow his advice and agreed to Kevin's terms for the divorce. Kevin and my mother left the house together, laughing uproariously and saying, Let us know when he's dead! <laughs> I was seething with rage and felt as if I would lose my mind. But the hardest hit was my father. I'm sorry, Dad. Kevin really messed up, I said. What? Don't worry about that. They'll surely get a taste of hell soon. I had no idea what my father was thinking at that time, but after his explanation, I quickly understood. Indeed, this way, we could show hell to them. From then on, I decided to live my life without paying any heed to those two. I hired a daytime caregiver, and I returned to my job as an office worker. My son was growing up healthily, and I was getting better at taking care of my father. My father seemed happy to be able to play with his grandson. I hoped my son would grow up to be like my father. Living this way, three years passed in a flash. A little while back, my father's health started deteriorating, and he was admitted to the hospital. And from then on, his condition didn't improve, and he passed away. I was prepared for it, so I was calmer than I thought. I immediately started arranging the funeral. My father was a well-respected man, and a lot of people attended his funeral. But among them, I ran into the last people I wanted to see. Long time no see. I hope you've been well. We came as we promised. It was none other than my mother Anna and my ex-husband Kevin. Why are you here? We came to fulfill a promise. My mother and ex-husband had shown up at my dear father's funeral. How dare you show up here after you did such a thing? Lila, most men and women are drawn together by instinct, so it's inevitable. Rational thinking doesn't apply to those of us who are attracted to each other. They seem not to mind it at all. If that's the case, why are you here at my father's funeral? Why don't you just spend time together? Well, it's my husband's funeral. It's only natural to attend. Plus, as I said earlier, I have a promise to fulfill. Kevin and I came to claim the inheritance. So tell me how much money I'm going to get. <laughs> I couldn't stop laughing at her comment. Unfortunately, you won't receive any inheritance. What? What are you talking about? Anna should get a portion of the inheritance. I'm sorry but my mom and dad are already divorced. I never agreed to any divorce. Have you forgotten that you once pushed a divorce paper on my dad? My dad saved it for a time like this. So after you left the house, I submitted the divorce paper. You're now just a stranger to my father, which means you're not eligible for inheritance. Upon hearing this, my mother and ex-husband turned pale. No way, that can't be true. Do you understand the situation now? Could you please leave? Many people who adored my father were gathered around us. Everyone was staring daggers at the two who had betrayed and hurt my father. Realizing the situation, 
they hastily left the venue. I heard that the two had been living a luxurious lifestyle that didn't match Kevin's income. It seemed like they had even spent all of my mother's savings and started incurring debt, saying they were at their limit. That's when they learned about my father's death. They thought they could use the inheritance to repay their debts, but their plans fell through as they didn't receive anything. Now, no one knows where they are. But honestly, I don't care. On the other hand, I had started working at my father's company a few years ago, and I had taken over as the president before his death. Right now, I'm nurturing my son while protecting my father's company as its president. One day, I hope my son will take over this company, but if he finds something else he wants to do, I am committed to supporting his dreams wholeheartedly. For now, while he is still small and adorable, I want to be there to witness his growth closely. Starting today, this is our place. Strangers can scram. Whoa, hold on a minute. What's going on with both of you? After my mother's funeral had just ended, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law began to insult me non-stop. My husband intervened, but the two of them showed no signs of slowing down. You're being tricked. Maybe you've been brainwashed or something? Haha. <laughs> That's right. It's all because your mom spoiled you. She's the one who raised you to be this way. Your mom's to blame. When my sister-in-law and mother-in-law badmouths my mother, my anger exploded. I can tolerate them speaking ill of me, but I absolutely will not tolerate them speaking ill of my deceased mother. My name is Kathy, 35 years old. I met my husband David, who is a year older than me, at work and we got married 5 years ago. I used to live with my mother and husband. Reflecting back, a lot has happened in these past 5 years. 5 years ago, I was working at the real estate company my father owned. I've always been interested in the flow of people and money, so I studied economics in college and applied that knowledge to my work. However, there were those who saw my success as a result of my own ability and those who thought it was due to my parents' influence. For example, when I heard people talking about me, they often referred to me as the boss's daughter rather than by my name. Moreover, my husband was the top salesperson in the same company. It seems that he was popular with many women and I received nasty glances from various people. Of course, I don't think that all of my work success is due to my own efforts. I believe it's all thanks to the cooperation of those around me. But I couldn't help but feel frustrated at being labeled as the boss's daughter. While I was living these frustrating days, my father passed away. My brother took over as president and the harsh stares towards me became even more severe. You must have screwed up. That's why your brother's now the president. Now we'll have to call you the president's sister, right? Haha. <laughs> Normally, I might just feel frustrated, but at that time, I had just lost my real father. Those words were hard to take for me, who was mentally worn out. After my father's funeral, a single thought crossed my mind. What do I really want to do? Even if I tried to keep going in this situation, something inspirational was missing. As I thought about it, I found myself saying, I want to be an investor in front of my husband. David, rather than rejecting my outrageous proposal, supported me. When I told my mom that I wanted to quit my job and become an investor, she laughed and said, You didn't have to worry about your father. You should have done what you loved from the start. Despite my father's recent death, this might seem outrageous. Before talking to my mother, I was always thinking about the negatives. But looking at my mother's smile, I began to feel that the opinions of others didn't matter. While dealing with the funeral, settling the estate, moving, and other busy tasks, I started as an investor. Of course, not everything went smoothly from the beginning, but my calm and cheerful husband and mother encouraged me every step of the way. Thanks to both of them, the investments I started with my savings and my father's inheritance went well. After a few years, my income had significantly increased compared to when I was working at the company. On the one hand, I was living a fulfilling life. 
But on the other hand, there were two people who were a big concern. My mother-in-law and sister-in-law. My sister-in-law is three years older than my husband, four years older than me, and she's still unmarried. From the time that David and I decided to get married, I got the feeling she wasn't particularly pleased. Even my mother-in-law seemed to think that I was just a rich little daddy's girl, despite the fact that I was working at the same level as any other employee, even though my father was the CEO. Every time I went to my in-laws, she'd make snide comments when my husband or father-in-law weren't around. Being a pampered princess, I bet you can't do housework worth a dime. It's a woman's job to do the chores. Please don't make David do it. Mother-in-law, my own mother taught me a lot, so I can handle things on my own. But since I'm also working, David and I help each other out. It was his idea, actually. But there was no way my mother-in-law would accept that. Even my sister-in-law was often aggravated in my presence, saying things like, It's absurd that a woman who makes her husband do housework can get married. My relationship with my mother-in-law and sister-in-law only got worse when my father-in-law passed away. It must be nice, huh? Living off David's money and slacking off at home? I have to put up with so much because my husband's gone. Why is it that you get to live so freely, Kathy? Mother-in-law, as I've told you before, I make a living as an investor. I'm not slacking off at all. In fact, I have less free time than when I was working a regular job. If you're really making a living, at least give me an allowance. You can't even have kids. You're really a good-for-nothing wife. With the death of my father-in-law, my mother-in-law became more fixated on money. She seemed to resent the fact that I, whom she considered a shut-in, didn't seem to be in financial distress, despite the fact that I had become less active outside the home as I continued my work as an investor. But that didn't mean I was thinking of giving my mother-in-law money. She claimed to be putting up with a lot, but every time I went to the in-laws, there were more and more luxury items. It was clear where the money would go if I gave it to her. I loved David, who didn't doubt people and didn't do anything to be doubted himself. So I had decided not to tell him about my in-laws. There was one time, however, that I confided in my own mother. Why can't I have children? The uncertainty looming as I approached 35 and the constant questions from my mother-in-law about when will you have a baby got to me. Her words calling me good for nothing wouldn't leave my mind and I ended up letting it out. But my mother just looked puzzled at my outburst. Well, I had you when I was 35, so it's okay. God will give us the right timing, I'm sure. Her words lightened my heart. Since then, even when my mother-in-law mentioned children, I was able to reassure myself children are a gift. Now, after these tumultuous five years, things are finally starting to calm down. Then, suddenly, my mother passed away. She had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Losing my mother, who has always been my beacon of light, plunged me into grief. David, who had lived with me for several years, seemed to be taking it pretty hard too, though he was kind and supportive. The funeral took place before we had fully come to terms with my mother's absence. Many people came to the funeral of my mother, who had worked as an executive at the company my brother took charge of, even after my father passed away. Among them were my mother-in-law and sister-in-law. It seemed they had timed it for when David was away from his seat. There's no need for condolences, right? Without even offering condolences, they started signing the register. I was simply dumbfounded at the insensitivity of my in-laws. And yet, when David returned, my in-laws changed their demeanor in an instant. You may be going through a tough time, but Kathy's shock is probably greater. You should support her. They would say as if they were considering my feelings. Later, when I was deeply feeling the exhaustion from the past busy few days, the doorbell rang at home. My husband, considerate as he is, answered the door to find my mother-in-law and sister-in-law. Due to David's kind nature, he thought they must have come to cheer me up. David invited the two in without any hesitation. As my mother-in-law and sister-in-law entered the living room, 
They glanced at me and drew an unpleasant curve on their mouths. And then they uttered words beyond my expectation. From today, this is our home. Outsiders should leave. M Mom? David exclaimed in surprise. But my mother-in-law didn't stop talking. Until now, we've put up with you because your mom was here. But now, only unemployed Kathy is left. If you are parasitized by such a woman, you will be ruined. We'll live together with you, so you should divorce Kathy. W what are you saying, Mom? At a time like this? And what do you mean by unemployed? I've told you many times that Kathy is an investor. When you say investor, it sounds like she has a proper job. But essentially, isn't she just playing around, buying and selling stocks? I wonder how such a woman can be a wife. You can find a much better wife. H hold on a minute. What do you mean by bad-mouthing Kathy? What do you two intend to say? Kathy earns her own money. Don't call it playing around. You're being fooled. You've been together with Kathy's mother all the time. Haven't you been brainwashed? Haha. <laughs> That's right. Kathy has become like this because her mom spoiled her. I understand why David wants to defend Kathy. After all, it's her mom's fault for raising Kathy like this. When my sister-in-law and mother-in-law badmouthed my mom, my anger, which had been lethargic until a moment ago, exploded. I can bear with them badmouthing me, but I will never tolerate them badmouthing my mom. Stop speaking ill of my deceased mother. I expressed my anger to its full extent and glared at my mother-in-law and sister-in-law. However, both of them were grinning, showing no signs of fear. Okay, okay, I get it. You don't like us speaking ill of your mom, huh? Haha. <laughs> ha. Now that the mom who has always sided with you and let you be a shut-in is gone, it must be hard for you to hear the truth. I looked down to see my clenched fist trembling. In order to suppress my own outburst, I took a deep breath. And just as I was about to retort, David, not me, was the one who spoke first. Enough is enough, Mom. Don't speak ill of Kathy or my mother-in-law. Kathy is not a shut-in. She's a bona fide investor. My mother-in-law and I have been cheering for Kathy's efforts all along. If Kathy was just playing around, neither my mother-in-law nor I would have allowed it. Even my mother-in-law and sister-in-law, and certainly I, couldn't hide our surprise at the usually calm David's low voice. As for my mother-in-law, she seemed unable to digest the situation and began to hastily make excuses. Don't be so angry. Even so, the life Kathy led so far was possible because of your earnings, right? Didn't you let her live a privileged life to the point of buying such a high-rise condo? Poor David. If you live with us, we'll do all the housework. Just give us a small allowance. That's all we need. The rest is... D don't you know, Mom? David interrupted my mother-in-law's words, speaking in a flustered voice. This apartment is Kathy's. What? At David's words, my mother-in-law let out an absurd cry. Unable to hide her surprise, she started to fact check with her eyes wide open. This apartment is Kathy's? Didn't you buy it? When did I ever say that? This apartment is a legacy from my father-in-law and Kathy got it. That's why the title, of course, is Kathy's. Plus, we split the living expenses evenly. I don't know what you guys are thinking, but Kathy earns more than I do. What? Not only my mother-in-law, but even my sister-in-law were surprised by David's confession. No wonder. They couldn't have imagined that I was earning more than David. My mother-in-law lost her momentum at David's words and became like a corpse. Taking over from my defeated mother-in-law, my sister-in-law opened her mouth. That, that can't be. Investors make that much. Making more money than working for a company just by buying and selling as an individual? I don't know about other investors. It might just be that Kathy has a good sense for it. But facts are facts. And yet, how dare you belittle my precious wife? This is our home? Don't kid me. Both of you, get out now. At David's words, my sister-in-law began to panic. What? Wait a minute. We sold our house thinking we could live here from today. What? Now it was my turn, along with my husband, to let out a cry of surprise. You sold our house. Why all of a sudden? 
At least you could have consulted with me. We, well, we thought we could live here. Besides, we didn't have money. I quit my job thinking you would support me. So if you don't let us live here, we'll be in trouble. Hey, Mom, say something. While looking at David with pleading eyes, my sister-in-law shook her mother, who had become like a corpse. However, perhaps the shock was too great, and my mother-in-law was in a daze. My sister-in-law, who had lost her confidence, clung to me this time. Hey, Kathy, I'm sorry. I apologize. Please persuade David for me. We can't survive like this. You said you sold her house, which means you have a considerable amount of money at hand, don't you? To the clinging sister-in-law, I said coldly. At that, the sister-in-law began to flip out at me. Don't get smart. Don't talk back. Just because your investments went well, don't get carried away. Enough is enough. David raised his voice, which echoed far more than the sister-in-law's scream. Towards the sister-in-law, who closed her mouth at that voice, David directed a sharp gaze. Forget about the house. I won't even ask for my share, so just get out of here right now. Saying that, my husband practically forced his mother and sister out of the house and locked the door. For a while, we could hear the sound of the doorbell and the pounding on the door, but after a while, it became quiet. After that, according to relatives, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law seemed to have rented a cheap apartment and started living together. My in-law's house, which was situated in a remote area, couldn't be sold for a high price, and the land was cheap too. My sister-in-law couldn't manage to get a decent job, and their money quickly ran out. Still not learning their lesson, they had tried to rely on me and David several times, but of course, we turned them away at the door. They had sold all the branded goods they owned, and now I hear they are barely making ends meet by working part-time jobs from morning till night. Meanwhile, I've been able to live freely as an investor without anyone around to make nasty comments. And next year, we're planning to add one more member to our family, just as my mother had said. I was thankful to her once again for being blessed at just the right time.